Sports Citizens of Tampa and board members, the Community Development Agency meeting for October 8, 2020 will now come to order. The invocation this morning will be led by Reverend Matthew James. I do want to leave us in the Pledge of Allegiance after the invocation. If you're able to stand, please do so. Reverend Matthew James is a native Floridian. He was born in Hillsborough County and is a graduate of Howard W. Blake High School. Reverend James attended Hillsborough Community College, T.J. James Bible Institute and Faith uh, Theological Seminary. In June of 2018, Reverend James received the Doctor of Divinity from Grace and Truth University. Reverend James is married to Eva, his wife of 51 years. They have three daughters and four lovely children. Currently, he serves as the Associate Minister of Bible-Based Fellowship Church in Perrywood. He's also the uh, local neighborhood pastor for the Will and Terrorist Community Crime Watch, with Ruth Fleming being the leader over there. Good morning, Reverend James, and you may begin, sir. Good morning to all of the councilmen and a special thank to Councilman Good. Bow with me in a moment of prayer. Almighty and merciful Father, we come thanking you for the members that we that make up this great council, who desire to do that which is right and just in your sight. For your word says, but in the multitude of councils there is safety. There is victory. Therefore, grant them wisdom and keen insight into all of their decision-making. And when the hard decisions come, may they all rely upon your Holy Spirit. This we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand, please do so for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Blue Republic, for which stands one nation under God, Uh, yes, sir. Morris Massey, CRA attorney. This virtual meeting of the CR Tampa CRA is being held in accordance with declarations and provisions of the governor's executive order 2069 as amended and extended by executive order 20-246 and the CRA emergency rules of procedure adopted pursuant to CRA resolution 2020-07. This means that uh, this CRA meeting is being conducted by remote participation and teleconference, which is referred to by the state of Florida statutes and rules as communications via technology or CMT. Uh, the public and citizens of the city of Tampa are able to watch, listen or view this meeting on cable TV and on the internet. Since this meeting is being conducted through the use of community media, media technology alternatives have been, methods have been uh, established for public to offer public comment by internet, voicemail, by mail, by speaking remotely during public comment, um, during the public hearing, um, providing comments in person at a CMT uh, device that's been provided at the Tampa Convention Center. Um, speaking comments may not exceed 400 words. Voicemail comments may not exceed three minutes in length. Uh, recorded and live public comments will be heard at the start of the meeting. Um, all public comments timely received by mail, email, or voicemail will be afforded equal consideration as if the public comments were made in person. And I will yield back to you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Messi. Just a little point of order, House Clean. If you uh, have your phones or computer, please mute your phones. Uh, if, if, you, if you're not speaking, please mute your phones or, or your computers. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, public comment. How many do we have at uh, TCC and how many do you have on the line for any uh, right answer? Yes, there's no one um, at the Tampa Convention Center at this time, and I have two registered to speak live on the webinar. However, I just have one that's logged on. Okay, well, we can begin with that one. All right, thank you. Um, that's Victor DiMaio. Uh, good morning, uh, CRA board members, Mr. Chairman. My name is Victor DeMaio, 4925 Independence Parkway, Suite 195 in Tampa. Uh, I'm just here uh, representing Malka Isaac uh, to report that uh, she has given her portion uh, 
to the city for the redesign of the Massey Park project downtown. Uh, that of course, as you know, is adjacent to her building, the old Kutro's Music Store, uh, also known as the Allen Hotel. And uh, we're just working on an agreement now with the city, uh, which should be completed here shortly. And I'm just here to answer any questions if anybody has them, but I wanted to uh, report to the board since uh, um, um, that's been a CRA project of, of longstanding. And we're looking forward to uh, the redesign of the park. Uh, hopefully uh, that we can have a, uh, a little seating area next to the building uh, for uh, uh, some restaurant service and the restoration of that 120 year old building that's adjacent to the hopefully redesigned new park. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I uh, look forward to uh, working with everybody on that project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, anyone else? Yes, sir. The other speaker did log on. That is Michael Randolph. If you could hear me, please unmute yourself. Mr. Michael Randolph, if you could hear me, please unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, we hear you, sir. Yes, hi. You. My name is uh, Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa Community Development Corporation. And just want to um, share with you some concerns in the community related to the West Tampa CRO that businesses, affected black businesses, are feeling that they are left out and not part of the overall strategy. And residents are feeling that they're not really part of the process of getting their ideas on what should happen in the CRA area. And that's very concerning uh, to us. And that we think that, especially in poor communities, residents and businesses, especially those that are minorities, should be part of the uh, process. So from the CDC perspective, we're very concerned about this. And we just want to express this to the CRA related to the uh, ongoing process of making sure that everybody has an opportunity to benefit from the CRA. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I'm sure Ms. Van Long heard that. I'm sure Mr. Robinson is probably listening. And I'm sure he'll be in touch with you, sir. Anyone else? Uh, about the no, Chair. That concludes the public comment portion of this agenda. Thank you so much. We'll go to staff reports out on number one. Ms. Van Long. Good morning, Chair and CRA Board members. Michelle Van Loan, Community Redevelopment Department. If we can pull up the PowerPoint for the staff report for number two. And if we can go to the next slide. Are we not doing the CSA report? Yes, so if Courtney's on the line, I'll turn it over to Courtney. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, I'm not used to not seeing a person standing next to me. So we have Rachel on the phone. Is Rachel on the phone for our community member uh, presentation? I'm here. Wonderful. You can go ahead and start. Okay. Um, well, I'm here to speak on behalf of the Tampa Heights CRA. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know, we have a couple of quick bullets on updates from what's been happening um, over the last couple of months. We wanted to update that the Heights Union building is nearing completion. The building is fully enclosed now and the interior construction is underway. If anyone's had an opportunity to drive down Tampa Street, you'll see some nice wide sidewalks that they've also installed, which um, really accents the building nicely. The first uh, of two roundabouts is also completed and that's down and along Palm Avenue. The Riverwalk has also been completed going up to the North Boulevard Bridge and is open for the public. So that's a nice uh, amenity that's available now and great access along the waterfront there um, as opposed to having to avoid all of the uh, barricades that are on the road. And then Sprouts was selected for the new grocery store and that's currently under construction. Um, then also we have a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, Friends of the Riverwalk is going to be doing a Riverwalk Halloween scavenger hunt that will encompass the entire Riverwalk, so some areas of the Tampa Heights CRA as well. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your work. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't, I don't, any questions in council? Yes, question. The default, you recognize. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Rachel. Um, 
Rachel, could you back up a little bit and tell us um, a little bit about yourself and, and how is it you came to be on the CAC? Do you, are you a resident or, or what? And, uh, and, yeah. and also, um, I know, unfortunately, this particular, um, <coughs> this particular district doesn't have a lot of, of discretionary money at this point, but, but uh, what are you looking forward to in terms of when you guys start accumulating more money, um, uh, what kind of projects are y'all looking forward to? And are you the chair? Are you the chair of this CAC? Um, I am not the chair. I am standing in for our chair. But my name is Rachel Radwick. I actually live in the Riverside Heights neighborhood, and I think if you guys are familiar with the Tampa Heights CRA, there really is no residential to it. Um, so I'm acting on behalf of the residents. I also work for the Tampa Downtown Partnership, and a portion of the CRA is within our district. Um, so I have kind of twofold interest in this space. Um, as you mentioned, we do not have a ton of available funds. The majority of our budget does go back um, into the uh, into the Soho Capital Project, which is doing great things for the CRA. So we are always happy to see how much um, Soho Capital has grown and brought people into this area. As we start to grow our funds, uh, we do have a prioritized list of items that we are looking at. Um, a lot of it is pedestrian level infrastructure. Lighting is a big topic of conversation. Wayfinding is a big topic of conversation. Um, one thing that comes up that's something that's very difficult for us is some of the transitions between our CRA and the other Southern Commerce section of Tampa Heights, which is over on Franklin Street, and building a better connection there. Unfortunately, the CRA boundary ends in the middle of Tampa Street, so our hands are tied on some things. And then additionally, we are looking forward to hopefully supporting some more events through um, the marketing grants that we have, the dollars that we have available to bring more people down into the Waterworks Park area once it is safe for us to gather in large groups again. Okay. Well, I appreciate the, the additional information. In regard to the Soho Capital folks, um, they do they attend your CIC meetings? Do they have a representative on there? And uh, do you get good cooperation uh, with, with those folks? From time to time, they have sent a representation. We kind of had had a revolving door of individuals who had been a representative, um, of, like a permanent seat on the CAC. I think it's just due to turnover of individuals within the organization. Um, they are a great partner for us, and they do send through Rob a lot of updates. So I do feel as though we stay up to date on the progress of the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Any other board member? Being none, we move on to number two. Thank you so much, Ms. Bradwick. And for number two, no we problem. have our monthly. Great day. Thank you. We have our monthly staff report. And if we can bring up, there was a PowerPoint. Courtney, are you on the phone? I'm here. I'll turn it over to Courtney Orr, the CRA manager for Ybor City. Hi. Good morning. Um, as Michelle just said, I'm Courtney Orr, Ebor City CRA Manager, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about bullet one and uh, three, a little off, um, off bullet for just a minute, just so that you are definitely aware of the Ebor City 7th Avenue Archway Light Project that we've been working on for multiple years and um, uh, trying to create the financing that we needed in order to do this project. The 7th Avenue Archway Light that span from New Co down to 21st Street currently are really in a state of repair. Those lights went up uh, to celebrate centennial, a centennial celebration, and uh, they were meant to not be there since um, for 20 years. They've been there since 2000. So for 20 years, they've been there, and, and they're iconic to the district and, um, again, in much need of repair. So we engaged with Pico several years ago to work with us on enhancing those as well as working on street, the sidewalk um, sidewalk improvements as well. So what we will be doing is we will be taking out or Tico will be taking out the existing poles that are grayish in color, very old, probably 100 years old, and replacing those poles with black powder coated poles that will be in keeping with the aesthetics of the streetscape of 7th Avenue. So that we hope will be able to kick off the project to kick off after Barrio Latino Commission approval 
in March or April, directly after Super Bowl. We didn't really want to mobilize until after the Super Bowl. So we will be hoping to kick that, launch that project um, finally in March or April of 2021. And since we are speaking to the fiscal year 21 budget, I just thought it was important to take a minute to explain the importance of this project. Um, again, and how those uh, archway lights have become an identity of two ebor and were meant to be temporary, but we are going to be putting up a more solid uh, wind load uh, approved structure uh, so that, you know, they'll last the test of time and, and it's something that they, the community really wants. So we're going to, we're going to make that happen. And you'll see that's a significant portion of the budget. However, once the project um, starts and is completed, those monies will be able to shift to other important priorities like affordable housing. So that, that combined my bullet one and bullet three there. Uh, we did actually see a fabricated archway out on Tico's property. Staff was able to do a review of one. And um, so we're excited. We actually see something that we can touch. Um, and they'll that will be there on their property for a few months as they try to figure out the lighting system and can work with with the actual structure and apply lights and make sure that the lights are um, the correct the correct ones and um, so we're moving that along okay i'll go back to bullet number two and let you know that the marketing and communications rfp that we had five respondents come back on um, or applied to the rfp that we evaluated all five. We narrowed it down to two companies that were very closely scored and they uh, went to the final round. We ultimately did select our current agency of record, HCP and Associates. So we have been very pleased with them the last several years. And so we will continue working with them and, and not be not skip a beat. So that's, that's great. And um, September meetings, we had a YCDC board meeting, a planning infrastructure, an economic development committee meeting, as well as a culture arts and special events committee meeting. Some of the topics we discussed were just bringing everyone up to speed on the COVID-19 business relief programs and the extension and uh, regulations to the Lift Up Local program. And we were able to um, have Brett Owen, who is our new District 3 PPD captain. Brett Owen participated in our call, and so we were able to have a a, a good discussion with him about issues that we would like PPD to assist us with in the district. And we uh, did a review of the work that the Brick Street subcommittee that is create, was created out of the Planning Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee. We have a subcommittee reviewing the Brick Streets in Ybor City so that hopefully we can bring some of those streets back or uncover some of the asphalt um, the bricks that are covered by asphalt. So they're doing a, a thorough review of, of all the brick streets and creating some sort of wish list, so to speak, to provide to administration, hopefully by the end of the year, so that um, we can put that on the radar of something that the community really would like to see more of in the district, more brick streets. Uh, next slide, please. And then in, uh, at the Cultural Arts and Special Events Subcommittee, we talked, we invited Rob and I to talk about public art initiatives and then the new citywide monument policy that various departments are working on to create so that we have a policy when people want to have a monument or a statue put into a park, for instance, we have a policy that uh, directs us in what we, can, what we can do for those requests. <clears throat> We, we have an educational sound installation project that we've been working with her on for um, several months. It was delayed just due to, be, due to COVID that some of the interviews, personal one-on-one -on -one interviews that were going to be done as part of that uh, educational installation project at Centennial Park um, had to be delayed. So we're hoping that in the spring we'll finally be able to do that um, installation. And, and actually what it is, is it, it includes um, interviews of just, um, individuals as well as the sounds and the things that you would hear if you were in the 1920s walking down 7th Avenue for instance what kind of noises would you hear and, and what kind of um, what kind of rhetoric would you hear you know what conversations so uh, we're excited about that project and 
we did make a motion due to the fact that some of the events that we were um, that we approved as under the special event grant program that the YCDC administers. Some of those have had to shift and pivot a little um, just due to due to the current situation. So we're we're asking that any of those events that we did provide funding assistance to come back to the board for review so that if their budget has changed or you know, has altered to a degree where the board doesn't feel that it's beneficial to the to the district to drive people into the district for instance to support our businesses uh, they may want to alter those the, the grant amount that we uh, provide to that particular promoter and as you know you've seen the letters that were sent to marco rubio and rick scott as well as governor DeSantis about save our stages and really just trying to help uh, support or um, reinforce the fact that we really uh, deeply care about our culture arts, culture and arts and we really want to make sure that they're um, highlighted for the need of uh, Pair Act funding. Next slide please. Um, well, now that we've moved into phase three of reopenings, uh, obviously activity is picking up, which is great, but that does mean more garbage in the district. So uh, recognizing this, um, we're just, we're work, we're, we were working with solid waste and actually hand delivering <coughs> notices to businesses so that they ha if they had service reduced, which many of them did because obviously they didn't need the full service that they normally were receiving, we've asked that they do reach out to solid waste and resume their regular service so that you know, keep the district looking looking nice. And uh, thank you for the approval. As you know, you approved the facade grant for the Cuban Club and uh, we appreciate that. And thank you for allowing that uh, to be approved so that those emergency repairs can happen. And uh, as always, we always have district improvements. Um, you'll see that we did finally complete Centro Ebor and Fernando Noriega parking garage restrooms that were a complete renovation. So um, feel free to pop in and check those bathrooms out. They they look really nice. Um, so that is that is complete. We're happy about that. Uh, pressure washing continues and and Brick Street repairs, et cetera. You know we're we're always on top of of making sure the the district's nice and tidy. And um, we're looking forward to two events. We, we actually have two events coming up. One is Taste the Latino Festival on November the 7th and Cuban Sandwich Festival November the 8th. Both will be held at Centro Estariano. So we're looking forward to those November events. And the community was very happy to see, oh, next slide please. The community was very happy to see that the Saturday market reopened, of course with um, CDC guidelines implemented but we did have 40 vendors participating. It was rough, it was actually like 37 vendors, but um, approximately 40 vendors that participated in the Saturday market after being shut down for several months. So we're happy to see that return on a, on a regular basis every Saturday going forward. And then Kota Haya, uh, the new Ebor Boutique Hotel, hosted a ribbon cutting and unfortunately, um, I know that there was a council meeting, so, so none of you were able to attend. But the good thing is we have a Ebor Chamber ribbon cutting that will occur on October the 21st from 11.30 to 12.30. So I want to personally invite all of you to attend. It's a Wednesday, so hopefully you're free, 11.30 to 12.30, October 21st. And, um, um, but it was, it was a very successful ribbon cutting, ribbon cutting that they had on September 24th. And what a major milestone this is for the district. It's, it's multi years in the making. Um, so to have a, a boutique hotel on a former parking lot site with the incorporation of two historic buildings and, and their restoration is, is wonderful. But overall, it was a very productive and positive month in Ebor. And that concludes my question, or my, concludes my uh, report if you have any questions. Thank you. Any board members, any questions? Mr. Chair, if I may make a couple comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ms. Orr, um, as a, a, a former YCDC board member, I am glad to hear that these street light, lights are, uh, are coming to fruition. I remember when it first started back when I was first with the board and Walter A. was president. So great job on that one. Um, is there hopes that in the uh, uh, 7th Avenue, rebricking? that we're going to be able to have enough bricks to uh, 
reclaim bricks to pave Seventh Avenue if needed. Was that in your discussion? Well, I I don't know what the actual inventory is of the brick, but I will say that there is more out there than I think anyone realizes. When we had an article written uh, in the Tampa Bay Times about a year ago uh, by Paul Guzzo uh, suggesting that we didn't have the quantity necessary to brick 7th Avenue, we have a master file in the office now of everybody that came out of the woodwork that said, I have a guest of brick. So, um, so we actually probably have a supply out there, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's going to come down to actual probably the financing of that. That's a that's a pretty pretty hefty project to do all of Seventh Avenue. I know at one point we discussed doing actually just a crosswalk uh, that might be more affordable and then the less intrusive to the businesses to not disrupt their operations. So we had uh, ended on crosswalks at one point, but I do know there's still strong interest in doing all of Seventh Avenue if if, if it's financially possible. Oh, fantastic. If, if we're going to redo 7th Avenue, we may as well use original bricks. And I would like to thank you and the YCDC board for, for supporting the Save Our Stages. As you know, City Council uh, put out a resolution in efforts to help that also. Uh, I went to Saturday Market. It is thriving again. Congratulations on that. And the Hotel Haya, as you said, is wonderful. I was there for yeah. a special event. Uh, congratulations on your great work, uh, your staff, um, uh, and, and the board. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Any other board members? Ms. Sir, uh, two things. Uh, can you give me the probably percentage with the reopening the third phase of the clubs and restaurants that I need to go now? Um, the percentage, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the, the percentage of patrons that are, that are back down in Ebor now for the, for the weekend night life. So there one night is like it's pretty booming. So the, what is that number? 60%, 70%, 80% operations back down with those clubs and uh, the restaurants? Well, I, I, I don't I don't know if I can say a percentage, but I mean, it's it's active. Um, it's definitely the streets are, are much fuller than they had been. And I'd say that it's it's, the nightlife is is very much in full swing in the district. Okay. Number two, I was kind of disappointed. I know we had the grand opening of the Hyatt Hotel. It was on a Thursday, a council day. So hopefully, I'll be able to uh, schedule a, a tour to, to see that building in my district. I was really want to see that. But again, a great project that's in uh, Ebor City now. Yeah, and I'll be certain to send the invitation to uh, to all of your aides to get those on that on your on your calendar for October 21st. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Who do we have next, Ms. Benlo? For the next slide, we're going to the West Tampa and Drew Park CRAs with Mr. Jesus. Good morning. This is Jesus Nino, the West Tampa and Drew Park CRA manager. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Uh, as far as the West Tampa CRA, the West Tampa uh, CRA Community Advisory Committee or CAC, they continue to hold very productive monthly meetings, including their subcommittees. Uh, staff is working closely with the chairman and the rest of the CAC to make sure they get information they need for projects out there. And hopefully we can improve that so we can get them more information and get them involved even more. Uh, the next bullet point is the West Tampa overlay uh, that was proposed is moving forward successfully. Uh, sometime this month, it goes before the next uh, board for hopefully approval to move on with the process there. Staff is continually sending out emails to the distribution list for West Tampa to keep the community involved as far as what's going on in West Tampa, um, including we're starting to do outreach to the businesses out there so we can get to know who they are and get them on the distribution list if they're not already on it. Uh, we're pretty happy to notify you that the first West Tampa uh, newsletter has for CRA has been created. If you don't already have a copy, we'll make sure to send you a copy. We're waiting for hard copies. And uh, once we get those, we'll mail those out to certain individuals and keep a few as well for individuals that wanna see it. But we have in digital form, we'll send that out to you if you don't have it already. Um, another thing we're happy about is that 
uh, all of you already read the build grant for the west side of the river walk we're going to get the cac involved with that so the build team is going to come to present before the cac um, this month and so we can all partner up with each other and make sure that moves forward successfully next slide please these are indirect cra activities in the west tampa uh, TICO is continuing um, undertaking two projects to extend power to the West River development. Uh, phase one is an underground distribution line running along Rome Avenue and Nassau Street, ending at West River. And phase two was also initiated in mid-September and is replacing lines and posts starting at Havana, running to Armenia, onto Chestnut, and extending to Rome Avenue. There is a little bit of traffic disruption. I've been out there to monitor the progress as much as I can and drive my car around there and even walk out there to see how much disruption and it's not very bad I can navigate it hopefully the community as well can can do that next slide please this is also indirect CRA activity uh, construction is still ongoing on three seven-story apartment buildings at the West River development project uh, together, this first phase of development will include 371 apartments and 6,300 square feet of retail, along with computer, library, and fitness community game rooms for the residents. Uh, these are expected to be open, hopefully, late 2021 or early 2022. These are going to be a mixture of affordable and market rate apartments. Uh, as far as disruption to the community, it's not very bad since it's mostly enclosed on the site. Uh, but I, I also continue to drive that area to make sure that if there is disruption, we talk to the developers or construction companies to make sure how we can mitigate all that for the community. Uh, next slide. Uh, site prep work still continues for the foundry at NoHo. It's a multifamily community that will consist of 191 units on one huge building that is pretty consistent with character with the surrounding community. Uh, it would also include a parking garage of precast concrete. Uh, the apartment will mostly be uh, made out of um, wood, wood framing. Uh, the apartment complex will encompass pretty much the entire square block that's bounded by Armenia, Howard, State, and Lemon. It's adjacent to the Glazer Family Jewish Community Center and the Villa Brothers Park. Uh, this construction is scheduled to be complete uh, hopefully sometime early in 2022. Uh, developers, the Richmond Group, and the architects are Humphreys and Partners Architects. Um, this also doesn't have too much disruption to the community at this stage since mostly, mostly it's all site prep work. Uh, next slide, please. We're all very happy that the Mary Bethune Cookman apartments renovations pretty much seem to be complete. I've been out there. Um, they indicate that tenants are moving in. I haven't seen that yet, but um, it's such a huge project. It's very beautiful. So we're very happy about that. Hopefully a ribbon cutting will be scheduled pretty soon. Next. And we'll make sure to keep you all involved and um, notified when all those ribbon cuttings are occurring, just including the CAC. Uh, the Renaissance at West River Development, which includes 160 affordable multifamily units for seniors and also includes retail office space, and that officially opened um, in late September. It's a very beautiful project as well. And we also have construction that continues for phase two of the Green Spine Cycle Tech, spanning about 2.6 miles along Cass Street. Uh, to provide connectivity between the downtown, West Tampa, and East Tampa, and also construction of the 35 million Cypress Street outfall stormwater project is being constructed there concurrently with that um, green spine cycle track spanning 2.6 miles. Next. This one, I kind of found out when I was driving the area, I saw that, uh, hopefully I'm not pronouncing their name incorrectly, um, a Goddard School, it's a private um, preschool. It's being constructed at 2401 West Kennedy uh, Boulevard between Armenia Avenue and Moody Avenue. 
Um, it seems to be moving along pretty quickly. And hopefully when that's done, it'll be very beautiful architecture and a good addition to the community right there on uh, Kennedy Boulevard, right at the periphery on the edge of our CRA boundary for West Tampa. And next. That concludes the West Tampa um, information. If you have any questions before I move on to the Drew Park. Any questions, any board members? You may proceed, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next one is the Drew Park CRA area. Um, basically, the linear park at Tampa Bay Boulevard is basically complete for the public. I've seen individuals walking the little sidewalk trail around the little park there. People are sitting at the benches enjoying themselves. There's still some work that needs to be done to complete the entire project, uh, which includes a meter for the lights there. Also, we installed uh, trash receptacles recently, and we have designs for signs that would have historical information on them. Once that's complete, then the park is basically finished completely. But right now, it's, it's open to the public, and I've seen individuals using that, so we're pretty happy about that. Next slide, please. Uh, the Drew Park Strategic Action Plan update that continues. We have a another virtual public meeting scheduled for this month and hopefully we can get word out to more businesses so we can make sure we get more individuals from the community involved with that process uh, so we'll make sure to keep you updated on that um, we've been doing basically the research for an analysis of the community right now at this stage with bhb inc that's the contractor we have for this project the consultant next please These are indirect activities for the Drew Park. Uh, across the street from Drew Park, um, CRA along the Air Cargo Road in Osborne, uh, CAE USA is building a new 40, 000, $40 million, $40 million 250,000 square foot facility. They plan to relocate about 500 existing employees to the new facilities as well as create 100 new jobs. So we're pretty happy about that since those individuals will hopefully venture over to the Drew Park area that new development will be right outside of the boundaries, but it's still right there in our effect Drew Park, so we're happy about that. Um, I drove over to the final renovations for the stadium center, which used to be the old steakhouse um, complex. It seems like it's finalizing the finishing um, touches on some of the units there, and from what I understand, uh, we have a lot of tenants that have already signed leases, so hopefully that opens to the public pretty soon. And that concludes Drew Park. Do you have any questions? Any questions, any board members? I had a question on, on West Tampa, Mr. Chairman. You're right, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Nino, um, good morning. Yes, sir. Good morning. Last winter, uh, council members went over and met with the mayor and we had a big a big dog and pony show over by the river um, on the city property that's right by um, right next to Ricks on the river. I um, can't remember what we call that property. I know it used to be the, the maintenance facility over there. Um, the Rome Yard. The Bone Yard? Rome Yard. We call it the Rome Yard. Rome Yard, okay. I, anyway, um, so I'm just wondering, we, ever since we did that, that meeting that was pre-COVID and it was kind of a press conference sort of thing, and I really haven't heard much on that. And I'm wondering, uh, I, I assume that's in, within the West Tampa CRA and uh, just wondering what's, what's new, what, what have we heard? Uh, is there a development of, a, of a, uh, an RFP happening? Are you on that committee or what? Yeah, I can fill you in from my part, from what I understand. It is a city-owned property, not a CRA-owned property, but the CRA is very involved, including we're going to make sure that the CAC stays involved with that. An RFP draft is being put together by city staff, and they're making sure the CRA staff is starting to get involved very closely with that, and we're going to make sure the CAC is involved with that as well. Um, so hopefully that's out pretty soon. Um, we have a... We have a special meeting with the CAC 
um, next Tuesday or Monday, I'll make sure to get you the exact date uh, for them to be updated on that RFP and for them to review the content. So um, we're we're making sure we're the CRA, West Tampa staff, and the CAC is very involved with that. But that is moving forward, and hopefully we can get that out to the to developers so they can you know respond to that RFP pretty soon. Do you do you have a draft of of the RFP? There is a draft in place that's being worked on still, and Ms. Van Loan probably knows more about it than I do, so if she wants to add anything, she's, she can do that. Good morning, okay. Michelle Van Loan. The RFP is being issued out of Vanessa McCleary's group over in Housing and Community Development, and uh, they're hoping, I believe, in mid-October to be able to get that RFP out on the streets. Uh, it is incorporated, Vanessa held two uh, presentations with the West Tampa CAC previously to get all of their input for what their priorities were for this development and their concerns. And that's what the special meeting is for next week is to uh, report back to them showing how they incorporated their concerns and give them an overview of the pertinent points that are being included in that RFP. Okay. Um so Michelle, do you or, or Mr. Nino have a copy of the latest draft of the RFP? We've been part of the review team. If you're requesting a copy, I can pass that request along to Vanessa and Carol Post. Okay. Yeah. Um, a year ago, when, when when this council or this CRA and council got going, um, we had long discussions with the administration about providing us with RFPs, especially major RFPs, uh, before they go out on the street. And, um, but it's specifically in regard to if, if the CRA is going to be part, part of this project, um, then I think inherently we should, you know, if, if they're showing it to the CAC, they should be, you know, uh, that should be shared with us. Mr. Chairman, I know it's slightly out of order, but at some point, either now or later in the meeting, I want to make a motion to uh, at our next uh, CRA meeting that we that we are provided or prior to that that we're provided with a copy of the RFP in a, whatever draft form it's in and, and include that discussion on our agenda um, if the chairman thinks that's appropriate. Well, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Dinko, you, you remember the board? We make a motion in that regard. We'll do that in in, uh, in, in the meeting, sir. In the meeting. End of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know the board members are on any other topic of the Drew Park West Tampa. You know we'll move forward. Ms. Bello. Did you before we move on, this is Morris Massey, the CRA attorney. I did want to make it clear that this is a the city the CRA is not funding any portion of this. This is not land that is was acquired for community redevelopment purposes that was part of the city's inventory. And so the CRA has historically in the, in the practice has been um, that the CRA and the CACs do formally review RFPs if the CRA is being asked to either fund it or if it's land that's been acquired with CRA money for community redevelopment purposes. So typically that's when you all get involved in the RFP process. Otherwise the RFPs are generally done through the administrative process and put on the street. Obviously nothing can move forward, no contract for the sale of the property, no contract for the development of the property, nothing like that can be moved forward without uh, your approval either as the CRA board or city council. So I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Thanks. Thank you, I, just, I think that Mr. Dinkfeld is just really saying since the CAC is being invited to be involved in the process and they're being allowed to look at the RFP, uh, I guess his question is why shouldn't the uh, RFP be looked at as well by the CRA? But of course, council uh, in another meeting, Mr. Dinkfeld Schuster can also ask at that particular meeting to make a motion at the city council meeting of CRP. I believe he would be in a world with his right to do so. Would you not agree, sir? Yeah, I, I think I would agree with everything the chairman just said. And Mr. Massey, uh, while at this point in time, you might be correct that the CRA is not necessarily directly involved, but I've got a feeling 
that down the road, um, you know, there's a very strong possibility that the, that the CRA, uh, the administration might ask the CRA to be involved uh, financially or otherwise. So, um, you know, with, with, with that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the administration wouldn't have any problem with my, my request that I'll make at the end of this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Yes, sir. Ms. Van Long, you can move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Chair. We'll move on to Rob Brosner and his four CRAs. Morning, Council and CRA Board. Um, so we have our direct activities for downtown. Uh, the Cass and Tyler Street Roadway work at the Performing Arts Center is uh, wrapping up. We're, we'll be showing you the phase four here in a moment. But uh, the paver intersection is complete. It looks really good. And they're starting to have access to the uh, arrival plaza at the Straws now that that portion of the street is open. The uh, timing for the street lights and, and the work that was been going on for a while should have been done yesterday. I haven't been out there today. Um, the river walk uh, at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, these pictures show how far along we've come. And these are about a week and a half old. So they've even come further along. But you can see that the concrete's all poured. The lights are, uh, bases are in place and they're doing the wiring now and the uh, special um, cameras and things that we got approval for uh, most recently. Next slide, please. So to give you a sense of where we are in the phases, we've completed phase one. Uh, phase two uh, is pretty much done. Uh, there's just some ancillary work. We, there was some uh, grading issues that we had to correct, but we've got those taken care of. Uh, Phase three is where they're about to start this week, as a matter of fact, tomorrow, and that's where they close uh, Cass Street, uh, um, I'm sorry, Tyler Street and McKinnis. Um, and uh, they're raising the intersection there about 18 inches, and so they'll be closing that intersection for about two to three weeks, uh, and that'll be done pretty quickly. And then um, you'll see in the phase four slide where they'll be moving on next for um, the McKinnis portion. So. For the most part, we're on schedule. The last things we're waiting for for the Riverwalk piece is the railings, which will match the Doyle Carlton railings down there, which are all nice cable, stainless steel, uh, high quality, uh, consistent look for the Riverwalk. Uh, and they'll be all done by Thanksgiving. So next slide, please. So in phase four, this gives you a sense here is that this is being taken from the Poe garage. And you can see where in yellow where McKinnis will be and where the building used to be and how that works. So uh, if you can kind of look through that yellow there, you'll see that the road is, is somewhat graded, uh, rough graded there, uh, ready to put in the remaining utilities. Uh, their intention is to get the phase three done, open the intersection, and then you can drive all the way around these blocks and then they'll put fencing up uh, and work inside the fence where this yellow area is. So McKinnis construction shouldn't affect any uh, on-street construction other than just making deliveries and if they're doing tie-ins to other utilities. For the most part, um, the Tyler and Cass will be open full uh, time after this when phase three is complete. And, uh, and they're just finishing final grading at the uh, library now. So the irrigation contractor's been out there uh, wrapping up final details and getting the meter set. So next uh, slide, please. So I, I will have the pleasure of touring some of the buildings that are under construction right now in Water Street, Tampa, and I wanted to share some of those with you. Um, the JW Marriott uh, is on track for completion. They turned the building over to uh, the Marriott staff uh, to start uh, doing all the final finishes and, and start making the beds and all the rooms and getting all the things ready for opening here in late November. So uh, what you'll see in the three, four photos that we have here is uh, the, the JW Marriott is taken from uh, one of the other buildings in, in Water Street, Tampa called 815. And uh, this is looking towards the convention center. So you can see that from a different view. Uh, these lower pictures down here are the ballrooms that, uh, that are inside the JW Marriott, which really expands our ability to bring more events into uh, the convention center as this is a convention center hotel. And, um, and then you can see a, a picture from one of the rooms uh, looking towards the Convention Center in the river and the sail plaza and how that's really transformed through these projects. So you can see the, the work what's on the ground, but also from what's on inside the building. This last photo is from uh, from the main lobby inside the JW Marriott. So 
uh, where those workers are right now is where the, uh, the uh, cafe space is at and where you can eat breakfast and, and dine in the evenings. And then there's a meeting room that that skybox is, is a meeting room over the space and it's gonna be a premium space. And right below that is a, a very nice bar in this area is, is, will be very social. So it's a very great addition to uh, downtown in this area. Next slide, please. So other notable events is the mobility department uh, has been doing great work and uh, they're, they announced that they're doing some new pedestrian and bike friendly improvements in downtown. Uh, these images here are for the Platte Street Bridge um, or Bahrain Bridge and then um, Florida going in the picture on the bottom here is uh, has the uh, Fort Brook garage to the left and uh, you can see City Hall would just be right off here so this is going uh, from Whiting up to Jackson is in this image here and then the improvements that are going to be added to Bahrain to adding bike lanes and uh, the additional coloring of the streets to uh, make it a lot safer and a lot more predictable how to drive in the area. So we, we want to thank the, uh, the mobility department for continuing to invest in downtown as well. Any questions for downtown before we move on? No. Me proceed, sir. Thank you. Next slide, please. So in Channel District, we are also doing very well. Uh, we have a lot of projects continuing to move on. You can see some of these have moved to 90 or 100 percent on some of theirs. The design is moving very well. Uh, we've been working with uh, all the different stakeholders and making sure they understand what's happening and when the construction will uh, start. Uh, and uh, this gives you an update of where we are on that. So more construction is about to happen soon with the Channel Side Drive project, as well as uh, getting final numbers we'll be bringing to you soon for the next GMP for uh, the next piece of work here coming up. Next slide, please. So we've uh, had really good uh, responses for the, uh, the strategic action plan and community redevelopment update per your request on, on July 23rd. We did have 10 interested responses and city staff has reviewed the submissions and uh, we'll be getting that, the negotiating process with them with the contracts administration department. We presented that to the CAC last night and had good response. Uh, other indirect activities is the Channel Club 2 um, project has received approval for their land use change for the additional density for the project. Uh, we'll continue to uh, finalize the negotiation for the uh, TECO uh, realignment of the uh, uh, transmission lines. Uh, that item is actually on the board here for the TECO agreement. Then we'll be coming back with a regular development agreements to settle up on their portion of, of that amount. But we had to get in a contract with Tico first to do that in order to finalize price. Then uh, the mobility plan, uh, we had a public meeting about that on the middle of, of September the 23rd. That went really well. We had the mobility department lead that process and we had uh, 38 individuals uh, attend uh, for the virtual public meeting and uh, had lots of good questions and we responded to the uh, more in-depth questions afterwards and the mobility department's been doing an excellent job of, of keeping the public informed about what they're planning to do there. Next slide please. Any questions before we move on to Tampa Heights? Maybe see you, sir. Thank you sir. So Tampa Heights Riverfront uh, Soho Capital is just marching away, getting it done, and we're, we're very proud of what the work they're doing there. Uh, as you heard from uh, Rachel earlier, uh, they, we are pleased with their their effort here. So what we have is the first of the two roundabouts is complete, which is shown in the lower right corner, and we're seeing a lot of bike traffic through there, which is excellent, and because it is more protected and predictable, and it provides a lot of visibility for people entering that uh, roundabout. Uh, you'll also see here that they finalized the exterior of the building of the Heights Union and it's starting to be a very attractive building and they're just wrapping up uh, landscaping and, and cleaning up the site and, and they're continuing to work on the interiors as we speak and they haven't given me a date of what the move in is but uh, you recall that Amgen is one of the major uh, people that are in, coming in here. Next slide please. So uh, before we leave uh, uh, the 
Tampa Heights, the Riverwalk is complete in this area, just like uh, Rachel was saying, and I was able to take some really great pictures and people are really starting to activate that and use it quite a bit. So I'm very excited to hear that they've completed that. Any questions on the Chandler Street before we, move, um, before we move on? I mean, the Tampa Heights before we move on? You may proceed, sir. Okay, Central Park CRA. We talked about the Meacham uh, Urban Farm progress here. Uh, I've shared some photos here that, that they site graded and they're put in uh, their driveway and getting their parking lot graded as well as getting their facilities uh, started. These photos are probably three or four weeks old uh, and they've progressed even further since then, but they don't plan to have um, actual growing until the spring, but they will be bringing uh, uh, vegetables and uh, other farm products to this area for the community's use and consumption um, until, that, until they start actually growing things in the spring. So this will be activated here soon. Uh, I haven't talked to Travis since uh, I took these photos, but uh, he assured me that late October to early November that they would be selling vegetables here from this location. Next slide, please. So on indirect activities, we have two excellent projects coming here. I reported a little bit on these before. The Independent Encore, they've uh, finished their garage, obviously, and they're done all their first floor work and their underground utilities and they're starting to go vertical. What you see in that top right corner uh, is you'll see the stair tower that's being put in and you're seeing the first of the floor plates that are being poured for that. Uh, as I recall that there's a number of floors that are gonna be concrete and then the rest will be wood. Uh, the Legacy and Encore um, is being, a, uh, being constructed by the same uh, construction company. So they're having both projects going on, but there'll be about a two or three month difference between the two projects. So we'll see a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, production here. So in the lower right photo that you see here, they put that garage up in a week, in a month, very fast. Uh, it was well organized, they had a good job of doing it. So uh, what's not on this here today is uh, one that just came out uh, this past week is the next block to the east of this block. Uh, which will be right on Nebraska. Uh, the THA has announced that they are opening the Adderley, which will be 109 units and it'll be a nine store building. Uh, so I, I have more to learn about that, but that is uh, a new development there to take up that last lot. Currently this contractor is using that lot for staging for these two projects right now. So I, I doubt if they'll start construction until at least spring. Next slide, please. Is there any questions on the Central Park CRA? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Lastly, we'll All turn right, it over to Ed Johnson and the East Tampa CRA. All right. Good morning, uh, Ed Johnson, CRA manager for East Tampa. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start with the uh, direct activities for East Tampa. Uh, as you know, uh, We've created the tree trimming grant program uh, the last fiscal year, and we have funded to date about $300,000 for this program. We had $100,000 uh, funded in FY20 and uh, $200,000 funded for uh, FY21, which started this month. And this particular program, we've received tremendous amount of responses continuing daily. Uh, we have over 200 app approved applications in the system that we are now processing through four uh, of our city certified contractors. In addition, we have uh, two other uh, non-certified city contractors that are minority contractors that we're working with now that uh, are available for those individuals that uh, want to select uh, a contractor on their own. So that is moving, uh, moving, moving along quite well. Uh, <clears throat> right now we have uh, contractors have submitted quotes and have scheduled appointments for approximately 75 residents. Uh, we, the contractors already have completed over 20 assignments and have provided invoices for payment. In addition, uh, we put out an RFP to solicit uh, minority contractors uh, to be able to add to our city certified list and we had 
three responses uh, to the RFP, which closed on uh, September 22nd. And we're working right now to get those new companies certified and get added to the list so we can uh, move the process along a lot faster. Next slide, please. Our affordable housing programs, as you know, we have uh, two major investments uh, in East Tampa. We have the down payment assistance and education program. Uh, they've completed uh, two classroom sessions, graduated uh, 19 individuals who have qualified to become first time home buyers. Three have purchased, uh, have purchased homes and have closed. Uh, and we have several that are pending purchased at this time. New classes for the first quarter of FY21 are scheduled for November 7th, 14th, and 21st, uh, and then December 5th and 12th. The Affordable Housing Rehabilitation Program that, that we started last year uh, actually stalled, unfortunately, because of the, our COVID challenges with staff unable to meet the, uh, the potential clients at city close facilities. Uh, the facilities now have limited access. The staff is beginning to work with several clients uh, that they're uh, processing uh, as we speak. Uh, we're also currently exploring the possibility of developing an RFP, RFQ solicitation to directly fund existing affordable housing uh, rehabilitation providers that, in, uh, that are working in this community. So there'll be more, you'll be hearing more on that as this process develops. Next slide, please. And I also like to always continue, continuously report on our programs that uh, we fund uh, with CRA dollars throughout the year. And of course, we're, we're very proud of our East Tampa Clean Team and our Youth Employment Program. Uh, that, is, that gets funded annually uh, through our budgeting process. This is kind of a report of the, the, the last month. Routine maintenance, uh, you know, they responsible for about 104 square miles of major thoroughfares and residential corridors that they service, which include, but are not limited to mowing, edging, herbicide treatment, litter abatement, snipe sign removal, and some minor, minor tree trimming. Uh, abatement of litter, trash, and debris. Uh, last month, 488 tons of debris was collected. Uh, special projects, uh, along uh, our quarters. Additionally, litter abatement continues at Burrell Park in conjunction with our Parks Department, as well as along Nebraska Avenue, which is uh, a quarter that, is, that uh, has the uh, Trinity Cafe feeding operation on it. So it's, uh, it's, a con it's constantly being uh, monitored to be able to make sure we stay on top of uh, the trash and litter that happens along that our folks are working that from I-4 all the way to Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard. Uh, they handle uh, rights of way, bus stops, underneath the overpasses. And in addition, we've responded to 137 service requests consisting of illegal dumping, graffiti abatement, tree concerns, alleyways, and vacant lot maintenance. Next slide, please. And these are some before and afters of some of the work that they do. And I, I can tell you when you go out and you look at some of this, uh, it's amazing the, the amount of work that our folks do that are working uh, in this particular department. As you can see, this is a, a stop sign that was blocked uh, along North 19th Street in East McBerry. Next slide. Uh, this one is a home that was demolished at 1513 East Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard, in this particular case, the owner decided to take down the property and clean it up himself, uh, which mitigated us uh, hiring someone to do it and, and charging, the, charging the homeowner. So they felt that it was uh, a lot less expensive for them to do it on their own. As you can see, it's been cleaned up very well. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another. Another example of the right-of-way maintenance that our folks do this is along the 1900 block of East 21st Avenue. You can see the before and the after is pretty dramatic. Next slide, please. Alley maintenance. Uh, you know, we have a number of alleys that uh, where a lot of the uh, homeless folks end up 
migrating to that are kind of buried uh, uh, along a lot of our corridors and become problems. So, uh, you know, our folks are actively working these alleyways and get them cleaned up. This one is along 1900 block of East Ida Street. You see the before and after there. It's pretty remarkable. Next slide, please. And uh, right away again, right away maintenance. This is on North Nebraska Avenue. You can see where on the before where they started working and of course what it looks like after they complete their, their work, their services. Next slide, please. And this is the alleyway that uh, gets a lot of attention that's near at the rear of the Trinity Cafe. And as you can see the before and the work that our folks did after to be able to clean that out. Clean up clean out a lot of the uh, the vagrancy that happens along these uh, alleyways. Next slide, please. And we're going to indirect. This is our uh, working with our mobility folks. This is a project that we continue to report on. This is the Columbus Drive Safety Improvement Project, which which in, uh, includes uh, complete streets, safety improvements from Nebraska Avenue to 14th Street including the eight foot wide sidewalks, uh, the block crosswalks and resurfacing. The key point of reason why I'm adding this to uh, our update is the construction uh, dollar amount. As you can see, this, this project has increased substantially since the last reporting. I think the last time we reported this the project was going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two million. So now you're seeing the, uh, the, the, the real cost. So it's a little over $4 million that's going to be invested in this particular quarter. Next slide, please. And that uh, takes us to our notable events in East Tampa. Uh, what is not on this particular side, slide is because this just happened uh, in the last couple of days. The, the, our CAC uh, had its election through the East Tampa Community Revitalization Partnership uh, uh, process. The election happened in uh, the end of September, and we had six new members that were uh, uh, were elected uh, in person and also via email. And the six new members coming on the board uh, were voted in: Ms. Connie Burton, Ms. Dominique Cobb, Ms. Noreen Copeland Miller. Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Ms. Yvette Lewis, Mr. Clinton Paris are added to our uh, the, the seven already existing members to make up our 13 members. And then this past Tuesday, uh, their very first meeting, they get to elect their chair and their vice chair. And I'm here to report to you that the CAC elected Ms. Connie Burton as its chair and Ms. Carol Marshall as its vice chair for the next for the next year. And so uh, continuing on, uh, we continue to meet with private sector developers discussing potential housing and commercial uh, project concepts. And we're continuing the whole uh, virtual uh, community advisory committee meeting. And uh, this month, we're going to be looking at going back to uh, having meetings with our full partnership. Uh, we'll probably do a combination of in-person and uh, virtual meetings going forward. And the last note that I have on here is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Marcus Marks, and I'm going to leave that to Ms. Van Loan, who has asked that she have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Marks. So that concludes my report at this time. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Before we get into questions, uh, Michelle Van Loan, CRA, I would request, I believe that Marcus Marks is on the phone and he is our newest addition to our department as the economic development specialist over in East Tampa. He had the ability to attend our CAC meeting and witness our uh, groups in, in action this past Tuesday. And I just wanted to take a minute to ask him to quickly introduce himself to our CRA board and to welcome him to our CRA family. Marcus, are you on the phone? Yes, ma'am, I am. If you want to just take a minute and tell the board a little about yourself and your background, and uh, I assume that would be great.
Marcus, you there? Speaking in front of such a, uh, yes, ma'am. You can go ahead and just give the board a couple of sentences about your background. Can you hear me? Can you? We sure can. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I just was, uh, uh, I had started talking before this. I'm so sorry. Uh, this is my first uh, formal meeting with uh, such a, a prestigious committee. Uh, please forgive my nomenclature if I don't uh, say the things uh, properly. I promise I will learn. Um, good morning to the council and uh, participating members. My name is Marcus Marks. I was hired on as the economic development specialist for the East Tampa area. Um, it's such a, a prestigious thing for myself. I've done so many things within the private sector as well as uh, other sectors, but uh, something that is near and dear to my heart, uh, being that I've come from communities like this, uh, it was an amazing opportunity to uh, be a part of this, this team, uh, and especially to see uh, certain boards like the CAC when I uh, experienced that, and as well as the other uh, subcommittees that I will be uh, uh, witnessing. Um, it, I've been listening in on you guys for quite some time now for probably the past, the past year <laughs> because I wanted to understand the agendas of Tampa. Um, my background is actually in uh, project management, uh, technology education, um, te uh, sorry, uh, engineering, building, drafting, uh, been in the industry for almost 20 years. Um, I hope to bring uh, some of the methodologies and the skill sets that I've learned to the agendas that's already in set, you know, uh, set in stone for uh, the East Tampa. So um, I'm excited to be a part of the team and, and I'm going to, you know, hush because I don't know what else to say. So thank you guys so much for giving me the platform to say, uh, introduce myself. Well, thank you and welcome aboard, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman? You recognize me, Dean Felder. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to welcome the gentleman, and, and uh, we're, we're thrilled that he's decided to come come to work with the city with 20 years of, uh, of development uh, experience. And I think that's fantastic because I know that that's that's what East Tampa East Tampa needs, as Mr. Chairman has point, pointed out on regular occasions. I also wanted to point out that uh, he has a great mentor there in, in the form of Ed Johnson. And, and Ed, has, Ed has put in a lifetime of, uh, of, of, of himself and uh, his commitment to our community and in various uh, various uh, places that he's worked, and including the East Campus CRA. So uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Ed for all of, all of his hard work, and and uh, and and I know he's going to be a great mentor to uh, to this new gentleman. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Ms. Malone, uh, we're going to take questions now in reference to East Tampa's uh, presentation. Yes, sir. Ed's still on the line. Any board members have any questions for this presentation? I have a few items, Ms. Malone. Uh, in reference to, I was glad to see the rehab uh, program on the agenda item. For East Tampa, uh, as you know, I'm very, very strong minded about that type of program. Uh, I've always said and there's no bite on the city program, but it just doesn't, it's not effective enough for what we need in some of the areas in the city and including East Tampa. We have money that just sit, sit, sits in that, in that uh, city uh, AHAP program that the criteria is too strict because it's tied to other federal dollars and we just can't get those dollars moved fast enough. Uh, I did talk to Ms. Van Long about this and Ms. McClary about other programs in North Carolina that have a extensive apprentice program that kind of mirrors what Ms. myself and Ms. Beard have been talking about. It can be very mirrored with the rehab program to where you're getting these outside uh, organization nonprofits to be doing that rehab and getting those young people involved with those companies to be a part of the apprenticeship program. So I'm hoping that we kind of mirror that a little bit, bring those folks on and be able to have a robust uh, rehab program that doesn't have such stringent criteria. You know, putting a paint, putting a little paint, fixing a fence, doing a roof. It shouldn't be that difficult to be able to do these type of things to beautify the community. Uh, I think a grant program would be the most efficient thing to do, and I'm hoping that we'll fall on that line in doing that. Um, so I'm glad to see that was on the presentation. Number two, the grant program. I'm glad to see community members are calling all the time. But one, one thing I am hearing, Mr. Johnson, I want you to pay most attention to, sir. I'm hearing that some of the contractors are price gouging. I don't know that to be 
true or not, but I'm hearing that a lot about inflation of prices or telling the residents you need to pay more of this and more of that, uh, exceeding what the uh, amount is uh, just because they're a city contracted person. So I, I wish that we make sure that we're watching that and be very mindful that people are, are starting to complain that they're thinking that the contracts are gouging. Uh, have you been hearing that at all, sir? Yes, we've heard a little bit of that. Uh, we've got actually, uh, Mr. Marks and I both have gone out to uh, a lot of the particular sites that uh, folks were making those complaints and we've uh, assessed those along with uh, uh, with our folks from from planning to to kind of gauge uh, uh, the price prices that our people are being charged and uh, we're wa we're watching it very carefully to uh, to ensure that it doesn't happen but uh, what we've asked uh, folks to do if they if they're not satisfied with the dollar amount that is being uh, quoted to them that they can call back into us and we will assign another contractor that will be able to go, go out and uh, uh, reassess it under their guidelines and see if see if the prices can get reduced if possible so we're doing a little bit of that at, at the present time but we are watching it, we are hearing it, and uh, we're going to stay on top of it. Thank you, sir. And lastly, let me uh, personally congratulate all of the new members to the CAC Board of East Tampa. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a wonderful uh, board to be on. Uh, the last two years, we've had a lot of successes, as you can see, with a lot of programs that Mr. Johnson began with the last couple of months that are really working and really fostering good relationship with our communities. What I would ask Mr. Johnson, that those folks who were not reelected, that you reach out to those folks, we need them on the community advisory committees. That is the most important committee we have, even though you have that CEC board, you need them on those advisory committees. So I would ask that you, you could reach out to those folks who did not or were not reelected and see if they can still be a part of the process to move the CRA in East Tampa. I think it's, uh, you have some good people on that board and they can bring, still bring those good ideas and be a part of those subcommittees, sir. Absolutely, we totally agree and uh, we, we made that very clear uh, to the new leadership that they need to reach out to uh, the existing uh, committee chairs that are there that have been doing good work for us. And we want to continue to make sure that they're part of that. So that will be something that the uh, the new chair will be uh, working on in the next week or so. Thank you, sir. Any board moves? Any other questions? Ms. Villon, you can move on. Thank you. Thank you. If we can share my screen. Thank you. So, Michelle Van Loan for my CRA director update. I just had a couple of items that I wanted to uh, review with you and report back to you on. Uh, we're going to see if I can actually work a PowerPoint and talk at the same time. So let, yesterday, I received the semi-final numbers for the One Tampa Relief Business Grant Program 1 and 2. I say semi, and I'll show you uh, a couple of these my, numbers. My phone is, my, my computer is about to die. Okay, here, you on the And so this diagram shows you our original commitment by our individual CRAs and the amount of interest that they put on the table to contribute. So that number across the top was each of the amounts from our interest line items across the CRAs. Uh, October payment shows what to date are the amounts that have are, would be the CRA contribution towards our CRA businesses. Uh, just as a reminder, downtown and channel districts look a little bit higher compared to the number of businesses assisted because they are funding at 100%, whereas the other CRAs are contributing at 50%. The reason for that was that the city was contributing 50% when the CRA overlapped with one of the low income census tracts and we do not have 100% match and alignment between the low income census tracts and our CRAs. So where there isn't overlap, the CRAs contribute 100% in those areas, and where we do have overlap, we split it 50-50. We show a payment balance escrow. These are for the handful of businesses that are still finalizing mostly 
uh, invoices for their utilities. And so our recommendation is that we will make these payments to the general fund that you see under the October yes. payment line. And then we will hold back just those small amounts in our interest line to be able to handle any of those last bills that come in. And about the first of the year or in December, we should have the last of that, what I'm calling an escrow amount balanced out. Below that, you can see then what the remaining balance is for the interest for each of the CRAs. And you can also see what our total contribution is uh, when you add together the escrow and the October payment. And then I also show the number of businesses that we assisted with those dollars. So across our CRAs, we're spending about $300,000, a little bit over to help about 109 businesses through our CRAs and in partnership with the city on the One Tampa business grant. I did want to note, uh, Rob mentioned the CAC met last night for Channel District and on Tuesday night for downtown. Both CACs have discussed their interest balance and in reference to CRA's inquiry into creating cultural assets grant program for COVID retrofit. So those balances in channel district of 743,000 and then in downtown of the 906,000, both CACs would like to contribute that money towards, uh, to be reprogrammed towards a COVID retrofit for our cultural assets. And we'll come back to you next month. So I just wanted to let you know they have voted to move forward with that. And if you have any questions on these numbers, uh, I'm happy to go over them with you over the coming months. The other balances that you see in Drew Park and East Tampa will work with the CRA board and the CACs now that they have their final numbers that they can come back to you with recommendations for programming, uh, additional housing programs they're working on during FY21 to be able to reprogram this money towards those programs and initiatives. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions, any board members, any questions? Your proceedings go on. Which brings us to staffing. We've, here is our current organizational chart. As you can see, uh, if we start at the very lower left-hand side, you'll see Mike Callahan joined us at the end of August. He is assisting the four CRAs that uh, Rob currently temporarily transitioning out of overseeing as our organization evolves. Uh, of downtown Channel District, Tampa Heights, and Central Park. Next to him, you can see Marcus Marks. We've added him under Ed as the new economic development specialist uh, working in East Tampa. And we are pending still with our ED specialist. Uh, we had made an offer to an incredibly talented young lady. And I just couldn't compete with one of the big three accounting firms out there. And they made her an offer she couldn't refuse. And uh, she will be still coming to Tampa, and we look forward to working with her when she's here in her economic development capacity. So we had a second excellent candidate, and HR is working with that candidate uh, on their background check. So I hope in the next few weeks we'll also be able to complete filling that position to assist Mr. Nino in the West Tampa Andrew Park CAC. We are transitioning Rob Rosner. As many of you know, he is, as of October 1st, officially in the title of Director of Economic Opportunity. The demands of his position are increasing a little bit faster than we had originally planned over the summer. And so we are now looking to fill his CRA manager position this fall, as opposed to waiting until the spring. Rob does continue to sit and be a part of our department both in spirit and physically, and he will be training our new manager and working with our new manager once we have them on board. And once I know that we've gotten that process through HR, I'll be coming back to you with their qualifications and their backgrounds and introducing them, uh, our new candidate to you. And we uh, are very excited. Uh, the candidate has been listening to our CAC meetings the past couple of days and has spent the past couple of weeks in detailed conversations with Rob about the nature of the job so that Rob has a good feel that this candidate is the right fit and that the candidate also has a good feel for what 
uh, they're working on with the Downtown Channel District, Central Park, and THR CRAs. The candidate does have extensive experience with CRAs and at management level uh, for over a decade, and we're very excited. So again, we just have to move forward with HR getting that requisition filled so we can backfill Rob's position. The one thing I would like to importantly add is that marketing has been a common theme, and by marketing I'm using it all encompassing for the moment, as public relations and our press releases and communications and assisting with marketing our programs and our initiatives, targeting the demographics who could most benefit from our programs and initiatives within our CRAs, our communications about events and the progress we're making. And over the past several years, especially coming out of the recession, a lot of those extra efforts had to fall by the wayside as our resources dwindled and our staff dwindled. Due to the comments and concerns and priorities of our CACs and our CRA members, I'm proposing to create a CRA marketing and projects coordinator. This is just a bulleted list of some of the examples of the work that they would be responsible for. I will email you these three or four slides uh, when we're done, I just finished this er, uh, very early this morning based on trying to get all the uh, one Tampa numbers together. Uh, primarily, this position I'm hoping would work as a centralized coordination across all the CRAs and, uh, and support the CRAs. They would attend the CAC meetings, the subcommittee meetings, understand their needs regarding PR and marketing, getting the word out on their programs, and also work then as that link between the CRA board and our media and helping us tell the story of our accomplishments and our progress within our CRAs. They would also, I included the word projects coordinator. Within our department, uh, just to give you an example, the budget book that you're, uh, that's before you today as an approval item, it has fallen to me over the past several years. All those photos are edited and put in. Uh, all the numbers are put into the charts. We just haven't had any kind of project person to focus on a lot of the product that we're producing, the number crunching, and it's also done at a high level. So I'm hoping that this person will also act to help us with the budget book and our annual activity report that we'll be starting on this fall, the PowerPoint presentations, helping to track the motions that CRA board uh, poses to us and ask that we come back and report on and helping with all of these presentations, along with uh, monitoring our legislative activity every spring, uh, what the state legislature is doing regarding CRAs. So this would be a marketing and project person that we'd be looking to create. My request today is approval from CRA board to move forward with creating this position until we know that the CRA board is interested in creating this position, uh, HR will then work with us to actually create the position, create the job description, and get this in our system. And uh, again, you've got the details there and I will get this to you. So. I'm happy to answer any questions about the nature of this position, and if you feel it's a right fit for our department, then I'd like to move forward with creating that. And that's the end Mr. of my uh, presentation on that item. Mr. Chair. Mr. Carlson, you're recognized. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Fenlon, you know this is my industry, my business and the other with my other hat on, so I'm happy to help in any way I can. Um, this sounds like a nuance, but I think it would be a good idea, and I'm happy to talk to you and HR about this, but first of all, I think the position is a good idea, but I think it, the nuance is that if in, in government and, and public-facing uh, um, positions, I think it's a good idea to use communication instead of marketing, um, and, and the new, I can explain this more, but the, <clears throat> the nuance in the industry is that, uh, quote-unquote, marketing people typically are trained um, in, in one-way communication, branding, um, uh, you know, fancy logos, fancy names, fancy brochures, and they're often not trained in how to uh, how to think about the sensitivity of working in a public environment or a government environment, 
And I think one of the bullet points we should put in there is engaging the public. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not like an a infrastructure project where we need to engage the public on a massive scale, but I think there has to be a certain level of listening also. We need somebody with, um, with some of the basic marketing skills, but I think communication uh, takes it broader. So uh, typically marketing is around customers and prospects where communication includes uh, constituents and, and citizens and activist groups and others. And so I, I think we need somebody with that sensitivity. So I'll shut up and we can talk about this offline if you like. We will certainly yes, make that adjustment. Ms. Yes, Eleanor, are you looking for a motion uh, now or at the end of the meeting? That is at your pleasure. We'll go ahead and we'll do it at the end. We'll come back around to it and we'll do all the motions at the end. Thank you. You may proceed. Our item number three, because CRA board received a lot of comments and feedback regarding the East Tampa CAC and how that election process works, I just wanted to provide a very quick overview to the CRA board and to the listening public about how that works. I think there's a lot of confusion. Uh, there's a lot of parts that come together with this. And so I just wanted to give you a quick overview. We have something called the ETCRP, which is the East Tampa Community Revitalization, Revitalization Partnership. It many times is referred to as the partnership or the ETCRP. It was created in late 2000, and it was a, an initiative with the support of USF and the community. At the time, we had 10 very active neighborhood associations that came together and partnered to create an umbrella organization whereby the neighborhood uh, associations could come together within East Tampa and interact and communicate and share ideas and also express their concerns and ideas up to the city. When the CRA board adopted its community advisory committee policy, it created new CACs and established CACs for all the CRAs. At the time, most of the CRAs did not have an existing community group. However, the CRA board at the time did recognize that the East Tampa community and the Ebor community both had very strong existing community groups. They did not wish to create competing governing groups and their policy adopted the governing body of the East Tampa Partnership as their CAC. And in doing that, they recognized the bylaws and the partnership as a separate third party entity and they adopt their governing board as their CAC members and they allow those CAC members to be chosen and selected through the process established in the bylaws of the partnership. The qualifications for serving on that advisory committee per your policy are that committee members must live work in the development area and or have significant interest within the CRA areas of influence. I'm pointing that part out because I believe there's some confusion that someone has to live within the CRA in order to serve on the CAC. That is incorrect for your policy or the East Tampa partnership bylaws. So I just wanna make it clear that anyone, if they work or they are just very active in the social services, in the community groups and improving the community and advancing the goals and priorities of the partnership. So residency itself, residency itself is not a requirement for membership on the CAC. This is the chart that is at the back of your policy for the CACs. And for East Tampa, it recognizes that you have 13 members and then it details property owners, residents, nonprofits, and also recognizes a category called at large. Again, recognizing that residency is not a requirement. This is taken from the actual bylaws of the East Tampa Community Revitalization Partnership. As I point out, it designates that there are six members of the 13 that can be designated at large. So again, that means that they may not actually live or work within the CRA, but they do have participation and interest and the improvement and betterment of the lives of our residents within the community. 
And again, later in Section 8, there's both Section 8 and E, where they again repeat that a significant interest is a qualifying uh, criteria for being on the CAC. Lastly, I just wanted to go over with everyone what our annual election process looks like for the partnership, and this is set out in their bylaws. In the spring, we go to the partnership meeting and the chair calls for volunteers to sit on the ad hoc nominating committee. The ad hoc nominating committee is established by the bylaws. When we have those volunteers, they come together and meet. They select a chair within their committee. We then advertise for applications. We put that in the Sentinel. We send that out in emails. We send it out through the community groups and the notice is done under the name of the chair of the ad hoc nominating committee. Once we receive all of those applications, the ad hoc nominating committee meets, they review all of the applications, and they submit their report to the CAC in June or July as to their recommendations and assessments of those applications. Once they've sent that report to the CAC, it is then given to the partnership and they present their slate of candidates and recommendations. Once it has gone to the partnership, we then bring that to you as the CRA board, and we call it an affirmation of the slate, and we did this back in July. We presented you with all 17 applications and the list of names, and the CRA board then approves that slate of candidates and has the opportunity to remove any members from that slate of candidates. Once the slate of candidates has been approved by the CRA board, we then go forward with the election. When we are not in COVID, we generally hold a forum at the partnership meeting in August where each candidate has the opportunity to get up and introduce themselves to the community and explain why they are wanting to be on the CAC. Because of COVID this year, we offered the opportunity for every candidate to create a little bio and send it into us. And we distributed that bio to our East Tampa community. 11 of the, actually in the end it was 16 candidates, one dropped out. So 11 of the 16 candidates did submit bios. We extended the deadline for the bios and sent several reminders to the candidates about submitting their bios right up until the election. On the day of the election, we had printed copies of those bios available for everyone who came in to vote. And then we held the election in September on the same day as our normal partnership meeting at Reagan Park. Again, because of COVID, the uh, CAC voted to allow people to vote by mail and to come in and vote in person. So with that, if anybody had any comments or questions about that, I'm happy to address those also. Any comments or questions? Mr. Chair. Ms. Carlson. Chair, Ms. Carlson. Um, I, we can't talk about any of this outside meetings because of sunshine. So I just wanted to let you all know, maybe you had the same, I had several, um, emails from, from the community and also, uh, calls and, um, uh, folks from the community wanted us to intervene. And I checked with Morris and I checked with, uh, Ms. Van Loan and, um, uh, the feedback I gave it was that it would be similar to the downtown partnership or YCDC that we don't intervene in their elections. In this case, the city or CRA is, is a little bit more involved than the others, uh, but because it's a separate organization, we can't intervene on it. And, and so that's the explanation I gave and trying to explain. Um, but the other thing I said, which I wanted you all to know, is that <clears throat> um, you know, we are the CRA board. And so if someone disagrees with any recommendation that, that ACAC makes in any of the CACs, they're welcome to come directly to us and they can give us directly to us. So I just, for anybody listening and also for my colleagues, um, uh, you know, we're the, we're the final stop and, and we listen to the public. We regularly have meetings and if we don't know somebody, we'll set up meetings with them. So encourage the public to reach out to us when needed. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman. Uh, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Calder. You recognize, sir. Thank you. Um, I heard somebody else too. I didn't want to cut them off. Um, I don't have a, a question, I, but I, I have a comment, and perhaps uh, I hope Mr. Chairman will allow allow me to make this uh, friendly motion at this time. Um, my comment is in regard to the former chair, uh, Ms. Natasha Goodley. Um, 
you know, I was just uh, over the last year that I've been exposed to her and, and the hard work that she put into the uh, to the CRA, the East Campus CRA, as chair and, and member. Um, you know, I, I want us to recognize that hard work, and and um, and and moreover, I want us to, as a as totally as a as a body, to encourage her to to stay on um, in, in whatever capacity is available, perhaps as a committee committee chair, or committee member, or what have you. Even if she's not formally on the CIC itself, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, she did a great job. She's got a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of intelligence, and uh, and and is a great asset for the for the community and the city. So, uh, uh, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if we ever um, if we ever do any uh, uh, commendations as a CRA, uh, but I'm 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 thinking that it would be nice if the CRA gave her Miss Goodley a commendation for her hard work. Um, does anybody have any experience with? CRA doing a commendation. I don't. I don't think it would preclude us from doing it. It's our board, and we should we could be able to recognize anyone. Uh, Mr. Massey, do you have any concerns about that, or should it be the pleasure of this board? Um, uh, Mr. Chair Morris Massey, um, typically I don't think the CRA has given commendations, but I don't see that that would be a problem if, if that was a pleasure of the CRA board to do so. Well, let's. Uh, Thank you, sir. And if Mr. Chairman wants to entertain it, I'd, I'd like to formalize that in a, in a, uh, a motion to uh, give a commendation to Ms. Goodley for her, uh, for her great work uh, as, as a member and chair of the uh, East Campus CRA and to encourage her to stay on board in whatever capacity is available uh, to her. Okay. Awesome. I have a motion on the floor by Mr. Dingfield, a second by Mr. Carlson. Any discussion? Any discussion? Madam Clerk, you take the roll, please. King Felder. King Felder. Yes. Woods. Yes. Manis Kako. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Dietro. Yes. Miranda. Miranda. And Carlson. Motion carry with Miranda being absent. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, Vieira. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. You're, rec you're recognized, sir. You're recognized. Let me just Thank follow. you, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, John, if Mr. Ding or Councilman Dingfelder, go ahead, sir. I mean, if if, if it's okay with Mr. Chair. Administratively, I'll just ask Annette to work with Sonia um, to uh, to prepare that. And Mr. Chairman, you can you can issue it under your you can review it initially. So. Yes, sir. Mr. Thank Vieira, you recognize now, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also wanted to echo just a couple of remarks, which is number one, with regards to the board or, or the CAC, I should say, you know, we're the CRA board, the board, the buck ultimately stops with us. Um, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm ignorant. I'm unaware of any um, formal, you know, um, binding involvement that this board has on, on those elections I'm, I'm i'm unaware of any but ultimately the buck stops with us as the as the, the cra board on all issues uh and and that's um uh how it is obviously here uh but also wanted to i wanted to thank councilman dingfelder for his uh highlighting natasha goodley i know councilman goods does a lot of work with her you know miss goodley is a very hard-working person i met her um man i think back in 2014 uh, back when I was on the board of the Tampa Hispanic Bar, uh, she and I worked on an event to honor um, Hispanic and Black veterans who served in Jim Crow time and before during the military. A lot of people don't know that Natasha's father, Johnny Goodley, is a decorated Vietnam veteran Purple Heart recipient and leads a group called, I think it's called the Fort Sumter Veterans, which is a group of about a, maybe 100, 150 but uh, African American veterans uh, in in the uh, in the Sumter area and whatnot, and he's a he's a fine gentleman and a very nice guy. I had the pleasure of uh, spending some time with him about five or six years ago. So I hold Miss Goodley in high regard. I think she's a good person, and I think she's done great work for the community. So I think it's appropriate to not only honor her but to encourage her to continue to be involved, because um, we'll probably seek her guidance on some issues. Uh, I I think going forward. So I I count her as an ally and a partner in uh, improving the East Tampa area and all of the city of Tampa. 
Uh, so I uh, I just wanted to echo that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Vera. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir, you recognize. Miranda, I, I just want to say that for the last couple of minutes I've been trying to get on, and I was muted uh, by the organizer, and then I finally got on. Now, thank you very much. That's what I want to say. Yes, sir. Anyone else before I make comments? Let me say this. Uh, a person who has actually sat on the East Tampa CAC and has seen throughout the years how it has been run. I can't say that structure and balance was really brought the last couple of years to the CAC board of East Tampa. You see all the viable programs that we're having, we're moving. And that's just because of the leadership of those folks that were on the board. Some some people can agree to disagree, but in the, in the end, you can see some of the rotation of the work that's being done. And that's why I tell Mr. Johnson, make sure we reach out to uh, Ms. Kim, Ms. Ms. Kim that was on that board with the land development. She knows that a lot of those folks have expertise, and we need to make sure we keep those folks around. But my biggest concern is, is reference to what I say uh, uh, a commitment across the board with all the CRAs because a few are operating totally differently. And I think East Tampa's time has come and gone with the way it operates. And I think that's why there's a lot of confusion in East Tampa when you talk about the CTRP. What's that? Do you talk about the CAC board? It's a lot of confusion. And I think we need to go to just a certain standard for all CRAs across the board to all of them are meeting the same standards and, certain, and same levels uh, to be equally balanced. Because I think that's what the problem is. And that's why we had a lot of confusion with this last process. And again, I think that all the bylaws need to be looked at and updated as well for all the CRAs as well. Uh, so I'm probably going to make a motion at the end of the meeting in reference to uh, the, the CRAs uh, uh, working together across the board uh, with the same rules, regulations, and that way we have a neutral ground and we don't have these kind of issues that pop up where we, board members don't know well, how come they're operating this way versus the way the regular CAC boards are operating. So I'm going to make a, a recommendation and motion uh, toward the end in reference to the, uh, the CRA boards, CAC boards. Uh, Ms. Van Long, anything else? If that's all the questions, I'm ready for item number four whenever you are. I, I take I take I, I digress one second. What do you what do, what do you think about that, Ms. Van Long? Since you've been operating them all, you've been all, all, all dealing with them all. What do you what do you believe in that strategy? I, I there's a case to be made for. I, I do believe there was a lot of confusion this year. Certainly exemplified that and amplified the difference. Uh, also, I believe originally when this was established. As the partnership, the neighborhood associations were much more active in the partnership and the governing board of the partnership was chosen because of the communication between the partnership and the neighborhood association presidents and the ability to communicate information back and forth from the partnership down through the neighborhood associations and back up from the neighborhood associations to the partnership. Over the years, uh, that communication has not been as strong as it was in the beginning. And if the CRA board feels that the original purpose for using the governing board of the partnership is no longer exists or is not as heavily weighed as the need for the consistency and the uniformity that everyone can count on what the process is and knows what we're doing moving forward, I think that the CRA board certainly is within your purview and I'll let Mr. Massey address this at the end when you go into it under new business uh, that we would still have a relationship with the partnership due to a recognition in both the bylaws of the partnership and our own agreements that recognize that the partnership plays a role in input. But uh, it is certainly a possibility to discuss a uh, updated makeup to what your CAC looks like. I believe West Tampa having been established in 2015 also makes a good model to at least be considered having ex officio members that are representatives to then bring in your neighborhood associations. So I think there's room for discussion uh, with the CRA board and with the neighborhood associations about how best to reflect the community as input up to your CRA board. Quickly, Mr. Chair, may I weigh in? 
if, if, Mr. Carlson, so, you recognize. Um, it, and Morris is probably going to say the same, similar things that I'll say, but I talked to him and, and also Ms. Van Loan about this extensively. And the way I look at it, Morris, you can tell me if this is wrong, but you know, of the CACs, we have uh, most of them are are tightly controlled by by the the CRA, uh, but there are three that um, because we wanted to historically partner with existing organizations. Um, they they were are standalone organizations that have their own bylaws their own board and then by contract uh, we we work with them and so uh the in, in the way i understand it the the choice the two choices we have are number one we could uh sever that relationship with that organization which i think would be a political disaster or we could suggest or or ask them to um to amend their bylaws in certain ways that we would recommend. Um, and, but since they're a separate organization, they don't necessarily have to do that. But then based on that feedback, we can decide whether we still want to have an agreement. And that, but as we're looking at these special relationships, the three that are separate entities, um, I think we should think of them equally. We, you know, would, how much interference would we, would we take in YCDC or, or downtown partnership as we look at that? And, you know, ultimately what we want is, is what Ms. Van Loan said. We want, representation from the public and um, I think CACs by themselves are are representative in some ways but with the new communication person and, and new staff on board what I'm hoping is that we could have more broader town hall meetings that will be more representative of the entire community where the CACs are are um, you know kind of interim representatives ultimately we want to know more about what the general public wants and we need uh, communication with the general public so I'll stop there uh, Mr. Morris so Thank you. Uh, Morris Massey, CRA attorney, if I could interrupt, and I just want to kind of talk about the CACs generally and then about the uh, East Tampa revitalization uh, partnership and our relationship with them. Uh, the CACs have been set up by CRA policy as a body of interested individuals from that either own property, reside in, or have an interest in one of your community redevelopment areas, and they were set up so that you could get community input about uh, revitalization efforts within each one of the individual CRAs. It's really uh, our effort to reach out to the community, um, and it, it's done by a policy that was adopted by the CRA years ago. Um, and so that's how the CACs operate, basically under a policy that you all adopted and they're there to help provide community input and make recommendation, recommendations um, to the CRA board for their consideration. Ultimately, you all make all the decisions relative to uh, how the CRA acts and what they do. Um, so uh, I just kind of want to clarify that. We do have, um, uh, the way our CACs are set up, there are, Two, really two anom anomalies. The, the partnership is involved in the downtown CRA, but they are just a member on the C, on, on the CAC um, on the CAC board. They don't. They, it's not the CAC for downtown per se. But um, the two anomalies are the two thing, The two organizations that we have recognized and have basically said that you are going to operate as a CAC for that redevelopment area is the YCDC for the Ebor, uh, the two Ebor City CRA areas. And then the East Tampa uh, Revitalization uh, Partnership, um, Community Partnership. Um, and uh, that relationship with the, the East Tampa Community Revital Revitalization Partnership, that's a lot to get out, uh, the partnership um, it, it arose as a result of actually the, the community development plan that was adopted for East Tampa. That plan actually recognizes in the plan itself that a committee, a subcommittee of that entity of the partnership would review um, capital improvements to fund tax, uh, to be funded with tax increment in, um, revenues and provide input to the CRA. So I, I, this is not to say that we couldn't establish a separate CAC for East Tampa, but uh, the partnership would still, and is recognized by the adopted plan um, as an entity that would also provide input to the CRA board for consideration. Um, the only way that you could totally sever any relationship with the partnership, frankly, is you'd have to go through the 
process of amending your plan. So I just want to clarify that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Anyone else? All right, Ms. Van Long, you can proceed. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to, I'll switch my screen here. We'll move on to item number four. And this is about our housing motion that was made last year. Over the past 18 months since you took office, there's been a lot of talk in our CACs and community, and you heard a lot of uh, comments and input from the community members while you were out on the campaign trail about the need for housing initiatives and housing support within our CRAs, especially within East Tampa and West Tampa. Uh, because of that, last fall, uh, or late last fall, there was a motion made by uh, Council Member Carlson about reviewing our budgets and looking at the ability to potentially, just to throw a number out there, 30% of our budgets be dedicated to housing. As a result of all these discussions during FY20 last spring and during the year, our CACs, several of them did work on additional housing initiatives to what they'd already had planned and what was in their strategic action plans, and they've been continuing to come forward with new programs. As a result of that, in our FY21 budget, I wanted to show you where we're at with the percentages for the budgets compared to the entire budget or our net budget. So in this chart, you see each of the respective CRA's FY21 budget. The first column on the left is the net budget. So that's the full budget for that CRA. If we looked at 30% of that full gross amount of the budget, you see that number in the second column there. And then I've highlighted the amounts that are dedicated in the FY21 budget for housing initiatives. As you can see, the downtown CRA with now the acquisition or pending acquisition of the land for affordable housing and workforce housing in the northwest corner of the CRA East Tampa is just fairly shy of 30%, as is West Tampa. Drew Park put in 100,000 for housing initiatives, but they also have land that they bought several years ago and spent well over 500,000 for on those parcels for the purpose of workforce uh, housing within Drew Park. We also looked at, if you take your FY21 budget less commitments, commitments would be your salaries, items like uh, the 74% that we talked about in the Tampa East Riverfront. If you look at the construction projects or the SPP or our uh, debt note that we pay in downtown for the convention center, you can see what those net budgets would be and also 30%. The numbers don't change as to which CRAs are still meeting those 30%. We are still showing that downtown East Tampa, West Tampa and Drew Park would be the CRAs most heavily right now focused on affordable housing. With that information, our recommendation for FY21, as mentioned, East Tampa, West Tampa, and downtown have met the 30% goal, and they didn't stop there. During this coming year, both East Tampa and West Tampa are continuing to work on housing initiatives. Uh, West Tampa has a fourth housing initiative potentially for rental that is in its subcommittee. And both East Tampa and West Tampa will be coming to CRA board uh, during FY21 to have their new programs formally adopted with all the criteria and the strategic uh, outline of what those grant programs would look like. So we feel that East Tampa, West Tampa, and downtown are moving along in the direction and with the priorities that were requested by this motion. For Drew Park and for Channel District, both of these CRAs are in the process of updating their strategic action plans. For Drew Park, one of the catalysts for updating the strategic action plan was updating the options for how to utilize the land that they did acquire for workforce housing. It was acquired uh, right before we went into the recession and due to the recession and limited dollars and interest at that time uh, for development of that property, we sat on the property 
Now, over the past year, year and a half, we've been approached by several different entities wanting to partner with us to develop that land into workforce housing. And so the CAC voted to move forward with updating their strategic action plan. And one of the primary focuses of that update will be to look at what is the appropriate use and need for that land. And again, the assumption is it will be workforce housing. It'll be a matter of how we move forward and who our partners will be in developing that land. Channel District, uh, as you all voted a few months ago, is updating its strategic action plan and community redevelopment plan. And by the spring, we'll be coming back with their recommendations and the potential, if any, for approaching and uh, pursuing any affordable housing or workforce housing initiatives. So we're asking for these two CRAs that we, the CRA board allow them to complete their update and their planning process and to come back with you with their recommendations for the FY22 budget for any housing initiative. For EBOR 1 and 2, EBOR, because they are a smaller budget as regards to the amount of revenue that they take in, and EBOR 2 has the higher percentage of residential single family homes, and yet is also the smaller budget dollar-wise. They have been saving up, as Courtney mentioned, for the last few years for the iconic archway renovation project, and much of their budget in FY21, more than 50% of it, is going to this construction project. Once this project is funded, the revenue stream for FY22 will have a lot more discretionary funds, and the two CACs will be working, or the one CAC for both CRAs, We'll be working during FY21 to develop housing initiatives, both for historic and workforce, to look at how they can address the needs that are slightly different between the EBOR 1 and the EBOR 2. And they will have the resources to develop initiatives for the FY20 budget and work towards that 30% goal in the FY22 budget. Lastly, Tampa Heights Riverfront, as we mentioned, 74% of the revenue stream is dedicated to paying for the infrastructure bond of that developer. And so we would not be able to meet the 30% in that CRA. As you saw in the budget, it also has a very small budget for now. It will be growing. So our recommendation is to continue over the next couple of years to fund the amenities and the improvements for the district as the district evolves and the type of community and district it is, which is not a focus on the residential or the single family residential. And most of that land is developer owned. And so our ability to influence it with 50,000 or 100,000 here or there is quite limited. So our recommendation is to continue to support the development pattern that is occurring there naturally with the developer and with the community. For Central Park, the majority of that land is under the control of Tampa Housing Authority, which is dedicated to affordable workforce and mixed use housing. The remainder of the land is primarily the commercial corridor and the land adjacent to that commercial corridor off of Nebraska. So for the next several years, we are recommending that the revenue that is discretionary in the neighborhood infrastructure, uh, we're just hitting 100,000 this year in that line item. So we would like to use that as we did a few months ago where we demolished a dilapidated building that was a safety hazard, where we can focus that money on the commercial corridor and reducing the blight on that corridor and helping to incent redevelopment along the Nebraska commercial corridor adjacent to the Tampa Housing Authority. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that may arise or any additional uh, information you may want on this item. Mr. Chair. Ms. Carlson, you recognize. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Fenlon, for the for the presentation and for all the work. Um, you all, my colleagues, uh, you all remember a year or so ago we talked about doing a strategic plan, and we uh, highlighted that an example of that would be affordable housing because that's something that the community has asked for us. Um, everyone from you know uh, uh, people who um, can't afford their own homes to the Tampa Chamber and other groups that have asked us to focus on this. And uh, this presentation shows that the CACs listen and it's a good uh, partnership where we hear feedback from the CACs, but we also give them 
suggestions and they've responded really quickly to that. So I want to thank all of them um, and thank the staff for working on this. Ms. Van Loon, my, my one question is, um, I know we're kind of in process of creating that plan we, that we stopped a few months ago as we were going through creating your position. But is there, should we make some kind of motion to, uh, to make this, this 30% one of our goals? Or um, is, is that already in the plan where we wouldn't have to make a motion to do that? Thank you for that. We do have your current motion that does say that you put out that 30%. If you wanted to codify it and make it a little bit more formal, you can certainly make that motion. Our CACs do know that this is a priority. And as you've seen, they've heard you and they also feel it's a priority and they recognize the needs of their community. So that is at the discretion of the CRA board. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'll just make a motion on it at the end. Um, but thank you to everybody thank you, for working hard on this. It's an important issue. Anyone else on this issue? Mr. Chair. You might have to think probably. Thank you. Two things, Mr. Carlson, uh, uh, great initiative on, on that. Um, uh, housing is, is definitely one of the one of the key challenges in our community. Um, Bill, what we might want to suggest is uh, is just that they keep coming back with a with a report maybe twice a year. Uh, today's update was very informative, and maybe Michelle can just keep coming back to us with you know with with uh, affordable housing reports every with a, with a goal you know with a certain goal of perhaps thirty percent. For some of the districts, but but most importantly, with an update in the report every six months. But anyway, that's that's my suggestion. I'll wait to hear what your motion is, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question to Michelle is in regard to Drew Park. Um, until this discussion, I was not aware of the five hundred thousand dollar acquisition uh, land acquisition that I guess was made back in the earlier in the in the two thousands. Um, so, Michelle, where where is that parcel? Um, how big is it and uh, how many units uh, could it accommodate today and uh, and why do we why do we need to wait until they change their strategic plan obviously if we purchase the land um, why can't we just move forward and, and, and start drafting an RFP and seeing what the uh, seeing what the development community wants to do to work with us on building affordable or the workforce housing in Drew Park True Park is an amazing, an amazing opportunity, um, I think, for workforce support. Um, anyway, a couple of questions. Michelle Van Loon, uh, the property was purchased when Jeanette Fenton uh, was the CRA manager. It was purchased before I even started working for the Drew Park CRA. So it's been at least seven to eight, possibly nine years since it was purchased. The CAC, the reason they wanted to go through the strategic action planning process is that the goals 10 or nine or eight years ago compared to today, they wanted to hear from the community as to what their needs. Do we need single family infill housing? Do we want something that is townhouse where it is also owned or do we want to partner for some sort of maybe apartment type? It would be a single uh, if we did do apartment, maybe a two-story uh, apartment complex that would just be a single line of apartments. There are two separate uh, acquisitions of land and assemblages of land. One is off of Manhattan and one I believe is on Coolidge. Uh, we can, Jesus can send you out this afternoon the exact acreage and details. These would not be large development. These are surrounded by single family homes and would be small infill development. So the CAC, it was their desire to find out from the community the nature of the type of housing, not just to be decided by developers, but to have that input first from the community. Well, I, I think it's all kind of good. My, my concern is, and this would go under the category of striking while the iron is hot. Um, right now, you know, all development seems to be very hot. Um, developers and banks, uh, still have money, and um, I mean clearly the Drew Park CRA doesn't have the money to do it, so we'd need to partner, you know, partner with uh, uh, with the development community. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'd like to 
you know, I, I'm concerned that that the all this development activity in our in the community in the, in the nation is going to slow down very soon, and then we'll just be sitting on these parcels uh, without you know without uh, without it having accomplished anything if we if we wait. So uh, I would encourage us to, uh, to to move forward, and I don't know that you need a, a strategic action plan to do it. And frankly, the participation from your neighborhood folks over there in Drew Park is so minimal anyway that I don't know what you're going to accomplish. You know what what we would accomplish by waiting. So that's just that's just one 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 uh, board member's opinion. Well, Mr. Tur Mr. Uh, Dean from I have to concur. I mean, if we've been sitting on a property, what, seven to eight years, and we've been doing ain't nothing and we own the property, that makes no sense to me. You can have a strategic action plan all day long, but if you're just sitting there doing nothing with that plan, and Drew Park does have, a, some, sometimes like East Tampa, a lack of participation to move things forward. And I, I have to encourage you, this this needs to be moved. If we're sitting on, uh, paying $500,000 off of some properties, and we're just sitting on them, that's just, that's just crazy to me. I, I, I think it's a suggestion very well that, uh, and Ms. Gunnell, I believe Mr. Depot is right. We need to start moving forward with uh, with looking at these problems or what we can do with this development before things do slow down. Mr. Nino will be taking it to his CAC at the next meeting. Thank you, Mel. Anybody else on this item? All right, we can move forward with item number five. Thank you. Let me switch out to our last uh, PowerPoint. I will have mastered this technology just in time for all of you to go back to live meetings. Our last motion that we are responding to on. First, before you go in, yes, you're in the slide. Sorry about that. Uh, Morris and I are just discussing strategy here as we go into this uh, motion. So this is the last staff report responding to motions by CRA board members. This motion was made by. Uh, Councilman Carlson regarding the request for staff to evaluate and come back with a recommendation to potentially cap the downtown CRA revenue and any revenue above the cap to remain with the general fund. And I'm going to turn it over to Massey to establish the legal side of this. Good morning, Morris Massey, CRA attorney. Um, per your motion, uh, relative to this item, um, you requested that I confirm with the uh, general counsel for the Florida Redevelopment Association that you did have the authority to cap uh, the city's um, uh, uh, contribution to the uh, tax increment fund at a uh, percentage lower than that is generally provided in, in Florida statutes. I did talk to Mr. Cliff Shepherd about this issue, and he did in fact confirm that you did have the legal authority to do that. He represents several CRAs, and he said that he has done it for some of his CRAs as well. Um, and in fact, there's a statute that does address the formula that's used for determining each local government's uh, or a taxing authority's contribution to a tax increment fund within a community redevelopment area. And um, it does provide that that can be changed uh, by ordinance. And so legally, if you all want to move forward with this, you can do so. There are some things that we do, will need to do uh, in order to effectuate it. Um, number one, you sitting as city council will have to pass an ordinance um, uh, adopting the cap. The other item that would have to be done concurrently, we have an interlocal agreement with Hills, between Hillsborough County, the CRA, and the city of Tampa regarding uh, the contribution made by the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County to each one of the tax increment funds uh, for each one of the CRAs within the city of Tampa. And we would have to amend that interlocal agreement, and so we'd have to work with the county to do so. I, it, it, as long as we're not, uh, the cap is, doesn't create a problem with any of the projects we've committed to with the county, which the, the primary one is the uh, Water Street project. I don't foresee that being an issue, but that would be something we'd have to work through with the county. So I, that's my legal analysis, and I'll turn this back over to Ms. Van Lund so she can uh, go over what she's suggesting in the way of a proposed cap. So within your slides, and you receive this in your backup, you've got the two slides from Morris uh, setting out the legal parameters. So you do have that in your backup for reference. Uh, I know this 
chart is very tiny. We've been presenting over the past several months the, a planning budget for downtown. Um, I wasn't expecting anyone to look at all of these individual detailed numbers. I'm just using it to point out a couple of items before we go into the recommendation. At the top, you can see in Peach those three numbers. Those are our projected revenues for FY 22, 23, and 24. They are based on a standard 5% revenue growth, which is the number that the budget office uses for planning purposes. And additionally, Mr. Rosner included additional revenue that would be generated by buildings that we estimate would come online and start paying property taxes during those fiscal years. Beyond FY24, which is then the numbers that are not in Peach, those are simply at a 5% increase year over year over year to get you estimated revenues. The other two small items I do want to point out that are on the spreadsheet due to discussion at CRA board, there is a line item in there for COVID-related improvements, as you've talked about, for cultural assets. So in the middle where you see that thick blue line, the top one does say COVID and it says $2 million. Uh, should CRA board next month vote to move forward with that? Right below that, also in the blue bar over three years is 5 million each year for three years for the STRAS. Again, just due to comments by CRA board members and this is just a planning document. Should CRA board choose to go in that direction to support their capital campaign, for the projects they'd like to pursue in the coming years, we wanted to be able to make sure that the budget would have the flexibility to be able to afford that project and be it that we reserved enough revenue to handle that type of project again, should the CRA board decide to move forward with that. With that, what we are looking at are giving you two separate options. These are just our ideas to make sure that we have the minimal amount of revenue to be able to, able to cover our commitments, the types of construction projects identified in the downtown strategic action plan, and as mentioned in the motion, provide enough wiggle room or gaps so that we are not having to forego projects in order to stay within the projected revenue. Option A is just, and I'll show you the dollars in a second, Option A is just a flat cap. Once we reach 22 million, we propose to just stay at 22 million and all additional revenue would remain with the general fund. What this option would do is treat the CRA and its revenue as a standard CRA. You would fund capital improvement projects, the infrastructure projects that uh, Rob reports on and that is in the spreadsheet as identified over the next 10 years. Here's all the different grid work and infrastructure needs that we foresee in the downtown CRA and that has been discussed within the strategic action plan and the CAC. This option would put more revenue in the long term into the general fund. Option B is the same proposal but includes once we hit the $22 million cap, a 2.5% increase year over year to account for any inflation and especially in construction costs. Construction costs for downtown do increase at a higher rate than Go ahead, Ms. So construction costs tend to, in downtown areas, do increase at a higher rate than construction that you see uh, in the adjacent areas and the surrounding areas. So option two would strictly allow us to provide a little bit of flexibility and also give us a little wiggle room that should there be items that come up that the CRA board would like to address, it gives you that flexibility. It still also provides a healthy amount of money that could remain with the general fund. What that would look like is option A again goes to a flat amount. You can see our projection. Again, the peach is 5% plus those few buildings and starting in FY25, it is strictly a 5% increase year over year. And we can cap an FY23 at 20 million and then at FY24 at 22 million. We cannot cap before then because of the commitments we currently have through the SPP agreement, through the convention center, through our bond payment. So for FY21 and 22, we cannot go below those two revenue amounts. 
but we are projected hopefully to hit 20 million in FY23. Anything that came in above the 20 million in FY23 would remain with the general fund. And the following year, we project we would hit the 22 million, and then we would cap it at that. So you can see after 10 years, at only a 5% projection year over year, you would put in about 26 million, would remain with the general fund instead of going to the CRA. Option B does the same thing, except it adds when you get into uh, FY25, it does have a 2.5% inflation built into it year over year. Anything above in the revenue would, again, the vast amount of it would go to the general fund and just that 2.5%. So it would only grow by 2.5% of the year before and not any greater than that. And you would still receive an estimated 14.5 million over a 10 year total. I do want to put this into one last uh, number item in perspective. As I mentioned, we use a 5% growth uh, multiplier. These are the actual growth rates year over year from for the past seven years for the downtown CRA. So you can see we've never been below. Again, past performance is never a guarantee of future performance. But right now we had a couple of years, uh, 15 and 17, that were at 6.3 and 8.6. Otherwise, you can see we've been in healthy double digits. So the numbers I'm proposing that would remain with the general fund at a 5% would be very conservative and the bare minimum that the general fund could expect to retain. And anything above and beyond that 5%, again, would remain with the general fund. So with that, I'm happy to entertain any questions by board members. Any questions, board members? Uh, Mr. Chair, could I just make a statement? Ms. Carlson, you're recognized. Yeah, <clears throat> this one, unlike the other one that we that we discussed, um, I don't know what you all have heard. I, I haven't heard opposition to it, and especially no big opposition. Um, we've tried to, um, in looking into the future, and in, in anticipate the uh, the needs of of the area and include um, the budgets to cover, first of all, all the commitments. I mean, I think we all agree we need to make sure we keep our commitments, but then uh, there's also budgets to cover um, many anticipated programs. Um, the key thing here is that if we put a cap on it, the money doesn't go away. Um, we or future council could decide uh, to, in a negotiation with the mayor, to, to pay for something else in downtown. It doesn't mean it can't be spent in downtown. It just means that downtown would compete with everybody else for that excess money. Um, and as I said on the other one, downtown has been a success. And um, now we have other areas that desperately need funding. And sure, there are always more things that we can do in downtown. And I'm a big supporter of downtown. Uh, but we have areas of our city that, um, that have been neglected for a long time. And we don't have uh, extra funds to, to move there. <clears throat> city council or the CRA board cannot determine where the general fund money would go, but city council can. And so if we, if we decide to uh, pick one of these options, uh, then we sitting at city council could, could indicate our intentions to the mayor and the chief of staff, and then we could um, try to negotiate that as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And well, Mar if I may. Oh. Ms. Vera, and Mar Miranda can go first, I, that's fine. Thank you very much. I'm in agreement with uh, most of everything, however, my my approach to it is a little bit more cautious. Uh, whatever CRAs have or don't, <clears throat> excuse me, don't have that are going to be capped at a certain thing, we have to find out, make a determination on what land is available that has not been yet uh, developed and what is that going to take uh, to finish those, that either small amount of land or large amount of land, depending what you're looking at, and to make sure that there's enough money there to cover the initial startup. When you look at downtown, and I'm not opposed to anyone uh, saying what happened, but what happened in Tampa is unique. When you have a human body, you got one heart, and that heart ain't pumping, the rest of the body is not going to work. When the decision was made by members of the council and, and the current past mayors, they looked at downtown and saw an opportunity. Name me one city in the country that has over 250,000 people in population and does not have a vibrant downtown, and I'll show you a city that's dying. Although most of us don't live in downtown, 
when way back there was maybe 600 people living downtown and that was it there was no businesses moving towards tampa in tampa or moving outside of tampa downtown was a catalyst who brought the people back in and now what you have here is maybe 20 times the amount of people and maybe i'm wrong but 20 times the amount of people who were living here 20 years ago so you had a catalyst that started pumping and then that catalyst sends that renaissance of development of newness of a unity that's coming up and they themselves start the same thing when i remember talking to many people that were associated and still are associated with the west shore projects they would always tell me how come it's downtown and not us my answer was very straightforward if you don't have a heart you don't have a body. If you don't have a downtown, you don't have a city. So it'll get to you. And look what's happening now in West Shore. They themselves are doing what is happening because they themselves notice that in the next year or two, the preponderance of plazas or what malls or wherever you want to call them is like everything else. It comes and it goes. You don't have propeller planes anymore. You've got jet engines and you're going to have something else in the future maybe electric engines, who knows? So it, it took planning, it took guts to stand up what we thought was right. And I'm not here to praise or undermine anything was done in the past or anything that's coming in the future. But the CRAs have done an outstanding job the way they were created and run by themselves. That's why I don't go to CRA meetings even when I'm invited because I don't want to give a presence of intimidation one way or another for them to do sitting as a board member of the CRA here is what I do. And I, they come to us, whether for us to go and make recommendations to them, in my opinion, is just too much for me to handle because I don't want to give an appearance. That's just me to myself. But since we've been talking about it, I'm bringing it out. So these are the things that I look at. These are the things that I stay in or stay away from because I know they're going to come to me. Just like when I abstain from voting on any properties that the trust that I manage has a, a jurisdiction, like most of the council members that at the time when they come, they all do the same thing. They all get out by saying the facts that they have a valid reason not to vote on that project. And I commend them for that. So that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Deere, are you recognized? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that. I appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, just a couple of thoughts and comments. I, I think this is fine to move forward. This appears to be very incremental. Um, I, I don't want to use the word narrowly tailored, but in other words, it doesn't go um, as expansive as the last proposal. I think this is fine to move forward. Uh, just a couple of points I wanted to make. You know, Councilman Miranda's points on downtown, I think, are very, very well taken. I always tell people that, you know, you can't be a, a, a viable uh, or a 21st century city without having a viable residential downtown. We've made great steps towards that. I think all of us, whether we're citywide or represent districts, need to have, while, while we fight obviously for our, our direct constituents, we need to fight for all of our constituents um, and, and make sure that we have a citywide approach. You know, I, I remember not to bring up uh, political struggles, but in my first campaign for city council, you know what, that, that was one of the big uh, debates that we have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you remember that, which is, you know, downtown versus the neighborhoods. And, and I always said that you can have both. You can have a viable downtown like any 21st century city should have while still investing in your neighborhoods and that we needed a better uh, balance, uh, a more balanced approach than that. I think you, you to put on our city council hat, you take a look at the budget that we just passed with some of the you know great investments that we make in disability friendly parks uh in east tampa and forest hills and new tampa different parts of the, throughout the city of tampa um that we're seeing that balanced approach that it's not that, that often we're given false choices between neighborhoods and downtown i think we can do both and i think that this you know ha has an incremental approach so I, I think this is fine to move forward, but just a, a couple of thoughts we, you know, we got to talk about whenever this eventually comes forward, if it comes to fruition, some sort of an agreement with the administration in terms of what to do with the dollars, if the funds, whatever amount they are, go into the general fund and then they're used to, you know, buy 20 more staplers, you know, and I, and I say that jokingly, of course, 
Um, but we, we want to make sure that we have an agreement in terms of what this is going to um, ultimately bring forward. And we want to talk about what we're going to lose. I always say that in life, very few things are black and white. There's gray. Um, and there's things where there's more good than bad. But you got to look at the bad. And I, and I want to um, you know, hear about what we would prospectively lose on this uh, uh, potential revenue. I know we're talking about agreements with the county, et cetera. You know, those are discussions that we have to that we have to do. I'm fine with moving this forward. Um, and, and then in terms of the options, um, I'd like to hear um, uh, from everyone on this, including the, the maker of the motion, Councilman Carlson, and I thank him for his leadership in, in, in bringing this issue. Um, you know, my thought is, is to have some sort of an inflation adjustment just so that we have some sort of a adjustable waist pants, I guess, if you will, uh, put on this agreement so that inflation uh, continues to be taken into account into those funds uh, that are going to be capped. I, I, I just think that procedurally that's a good thing. And then last, speaking of that, Gray, I mean, it's no secret that there's a war on CRAs in Tallahassee. Um, and, and I'd like to explore what do options like this do to give credence or comfort to that opposition, um, just as a general dialogue. So again, I'm willing to move this forward. I thank the Councilman uh, uh, Carlson for his leadership on this issue. Um, but, but I'm willing to move it forward, but I think there's some questions that, that uh, should be addressed in the meanwhile. And again, let's go for the adjustable waste pants on this with the inflation, in my opinion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Anyone else on motion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But, uh, Citro? The Citro? Dingfelder. But... Dingfelder. Sorry, sir. Mr. Dingfelder, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, lots of good thoughts uh, bouncing around. Um, First off, Mr. Carlson, uh, I, I compliment you regularly. You're always thinking outside the box, including the affordable housing discussion we had uh, a few minutes ago. Um, on this particular one, I, I, I feel, I don't feel as comfortable with it. Um, my first question is, and this, this probably goes back to perhaps a, a Charlie Miranda um, comment that I hear sometimes, that if it ain't broken, why are we fixing it? Um, I, you know, you, you say you haven't heard people objecting to this, but I, frankly, I haven't heard people clamoring for this either. Um, I don't know why, I mean, I appreciate the, the, the discussion. I appreciate the analysis, detailed analysis, uh, as always by Ms. Van Loon, but I don't, I don't know why we would cap it at all. Um, right now. Right now, the CRA is, is growing. All the CRAs are growing. The downtown CRA is growing the most in terms of actual numbers and dollar amounts. Um, and we, we as a CRA board have a very unique opportunity to ourselves, the seven of us, to decide uh, how and where that money is spent. Mr. Citro uh, uh, led the charge, and I, and I, I, I compliment you, Joe, we led the charge uh, over the last year to say, let's do something real in downtown for affordable workforce housing. And guess what? We had the flexibility, we had the money to be able to do it. Um, you know, if we had if we had a, had a self-imposed cap on ourselves at this time, you know, then perhaps we wouldn't have that flexibility. Uh, lots of in a in a downtown as complex as as ours. Lots of issues pop up. Um, you know, five, five years ago, the convention center started realizing that they needed to do some major upgrades and, and, and improvements and, 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 and expansion to keep up with the market. So because the downtown CRA is so vibrant and so um, uh, has some decent money, we were able to make that commitment. Likewise, when Mr. Bennett came along and the SPP group, um, you know, and said, uh, you know, we'd like to partner with the city slash CRA. The city didn't have the money to do that, but the CRA did. We didn't know Mr. Binnick would come along and, and be able to create these phenomenal uh, buildings and development that he did. But because we had this money, we were able to partner with him. Uh, now we've got the straws who um, are, they're hurting uh, as our, as is the Tampa theater and all of our public institutions downtown, they're hurting. Uh, so Michelle has identified the $2 million fund that we're gonna be able to help them. But again, if we if we have a cap on ourselves, um, well, we wouldn't have that flexibility. 
So with all due respect to my good friend, Mr. Carlson, who, who always comes up with great ideas outside the box, I, 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 I can't support this one. And, the, and then the, the last point is, is what do we accomplish? Okay. Well, I just, I just did some math, just basic, some real basic math. If we, this total city, city budget this past year was more than a billion dollars. Okay. If we say, oh, we, we might have three or $4 million to throw in, to throw back into the city budget. That's like, that's, that's, that's like throwing a, a cup of water into the ocean and, and thinking we're going to raise the ocean level. Three million divided by one billion is point is point three percent is one third of one percent. So I don't think we're really accomplishing anything for the total city, but by God, I think we're accomplishing great things downtown. So anyway, that's that's my diatribe, and I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. And again, Mr. Carlson, I know you'll take my comments in the way they're meant without any insult. Thank you, Mr. Dingfield. Anyone else for discussion? Uh, if I Anyone may add, Chairman, it's Randy you recognize. You recognize, sir. And I, I, I firmly believe that we have to explore what we're going to do before we do it. Let me explain what I said there. If we have to make an agreement, which we should, and I know legally you have to, more than likely, with the administration, shouldn't we be speaking to the administration before we have a plan? So that they understand what's going on. Sometimes we as council members we're wearing the other hat, we say the administration has to talk to us. How can we pass that? Rightly so. But what I'm saying now, we're the CRA board. Maybe we ought to talk to the administration to see where they're at on this idealism to do it. I'm not against the program altogether. But if we're going to start all this, then let's find out what the administration and the CRA board are willing to compromise on to have a plan going forward. So the monies that are there, we can find out how much properties are left in the CRA, what's the benefit of it, what's not the benefit of it, and we can have a conversation of thought for the future. And you've heard me say many times, yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. Well, it's about time for tomorrow, and what we do today will be here forever. So these things have to be worked out with the administration, and I'm not opposed to maybe putting Mr. Carlton in charge of that, let him go out and bring the administration and work out a plan so that the rest of the board can review. That's what I'm saying, Mr. Chairman. I like to hear all sides. We mentioned the administration, but we haven't heard from them. So I think we ought to start a movement to meet with the administration to get these things on the board, see if it works or doesn't work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? Mr. Chair. Oh, yes, Mr. Could, could I either respond now or after, maybe after your comments? Yeah. I know you sure usually go yeah, last, but I'll, I'll let you decide. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me let me make my comments. That you can chime in afterwards, uh, uh, so you know where I'm headed. At, if you don't mind. Uh, anybody else before I make my comments? Let me say this. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Uh, Maniscalco. Just quickly. you're recognized, sir. You're recognized. You're recognized. Thank you very much. I, you know, I've, I've kept quiet and I've been listening. And I, you know, I, I echo what Councilmember Vieira said. You know, in terms of what was previously proposed, I think this is something. Uh, a little wiser and, and, and safer um, and incremental. Uh, we don't want to rush anything. Uh, we want to uh, be careful with this. Um, and also what council member Miranda said was, you know, we haven't heard from the administration yet. You know, we, we would hope to be on the same page and, and play ball together with this and move forward, you know, in harmony. And, uh, and that's it. So I mean, as long as we're moving forward uh, carefully and not rushing anything, um, you know, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? And Mr. Chair, if I may, just very quickly, Vera. Yes, sir. You recognize. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, and, and, and an idea we may have is going forward on, on specific citywide needs that we may have for those funds. For example, in November, um, I think it is, uh, I motioned for the administration to come back on a citywide um, uh, uh, public safety master plan, similar to what we're doing with parks and recreation. Um, and, and we're going to hear of those deficits that we have throughout the city of Tampa on issues of public safety, um, you know, where, where these funds potentially uh, could could come into good use. I, again, I repeat what I said, which is there's a lot of gray here. I think that it leans towards the good, and we should proceed with this. Um, but there's a lot of gray here, certainly. Um, but but I cer certainly think it leans strongly towards uh, going forward. 
Uh, thank you for that second bite at the apple, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Well, let me say this. Uh, I've looked at the proposed from Ms. Van Long. I'm very skeptical. I'm reminded you never give up what you got in negotiations. Uh, I looked at the CRA of this past year and a half where we've been working diligently, and this board has dictated what the movement should be in each one of these CRAs, what we want. We have the control now. I'm fearful that if you give up that control and you say we do a cap and you say this money goes into the general fund, I'm fearful that that, that would be a battle down the road, a huge battle. Ms. Miranda is right. You talk about the administration. We have met with them. I'm reminded of a downtown when I went on a trip to Chicago, which was a big, big deal for what I don't know. But when you go to other places and you want to be a vibrant city, you look at their downtown. And when I go to other cities, I go to their downtowns, I see their shops, uh, their restaurants. We want that in all our CRAs. But I'm reminded when my fraternity many uh, years ago wanted to bring our convention here, they wouldn't come because they said we weren't ready yet. We didn't have enough hotels. Our convention center wasn't big enough to host our, our members. And these are the things I hear around the country when people talk about coming to camp at times, we're not big enough yet to host certain conventions. We've had some nice ones that people gave us an opportunity, but a lot of organizations do not come because they think we don't have enough hotel space. We don't have enough amenities in our downtown. Uh, transportation issues was, was another big one for our, my fraternity that the transportation for our members to get around town or, or in the downtown area. Uh, but we're going to give Tampa a shot in a couple of years, I believe it's 20, 22 that will be here. Capital Side will be in Tampa uh, with our membership. Uh, I know Ms. Sherry over at the uh, Convention Center has been working very hard with our group to bring a massive number of capitals to Tampa. So right now, I, I think there's some more work that needs to be done on this proposal. I'm just fearful that the way the economy is going up and down and the needs of uh, some of the uh, fixtures that need to be done in the different areas in the downtown uh, might not be there in the long haul. We might not be able to help them out. And that's what CRA is for, for that particular area. Again, I know some might say, well, they've got this bunch of money. It should go in the general to go help other areas. Uh, and they, some could be right, but I don't think the, the little bit of money going at that general fund is going to really help out a lot. Uh, I looked at East Tampa. We're moving. We have money. We're making strong strides to say this is what has to be done. And we're telling our Sierra board director what needs to be done and what we want. And that's how we're going to grow. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little leery right now of uh, of this recommendation. I, I'd like to hear more. Uh, so uh, I'll hear Mr. Carlson's uh, rebuttal and, and see where it goes. Mr. Carlson, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I'll keep this short. Um, uh, I, I liked um, Ms. Miranda's idea, if you all would approve it, when we get to motions or I can make it now to maybe um, set a future date when uh, the administration could come back and um, after having discussions with us, uh, come back and talk about how this money could be spent, how it could be allocated. And technically by charter city council has control of the budget, but you all know how it works. And it's a good idea to um, to start that conversation. My understanding and talking to staff, I don't think I directly asked the mayor, but my understanding was that the mayor was in favor of this. And even um, I heard that Bob McDonough um, had been in favor of it too but um, you'd have to ask them uh, their opinion and we can talk to the administration. So what, uh, what I'll make a motion on later is just to, to ask the administration to come back and discuss it. I, I'm not trying to rush us into anything, um, but uh, starting with Mr. Vieira's comments about the legislature, you know, I've talked to legislators and, and others um, about the CRA problem and this one in Channel District and the one in downtown are examples of CRAs that there are examples that are used. I don't think those two examples have been used yet, but those are examples of why the legislature wants to kill CRAs because um, it, if you all remember, the rest of the city is subsidizing it. And every day I get tons of emails. You all probably get the same, but I get tons of emails of people mad that their trees haven't been trimmed, that their alleys aren't kept up, that, they, that there are potholes in their, in their streets, that there's flooding. And some of those things we've resolved, but um, even though the budget is a billion dollars, if we add a million dollars, it could fix multiple parks. We knew with Fair Oaks Community Center that uh, the last administration passed up spending $150,000 just to repaint it. I mean, there are basic things that 
need to be done. Uh, south of Gandhi, um, many of you all have heard the same thing that I've heard. That area was completely neglected for a long, long time. And um, you all know I have three kids, and, and the way downtown was treated the last few years, it's kind of like um, you give all the money and all the attention to one kid and you ignore the others. And that's how the neighborhoods feel. Uh, and now that people, because of COVID, are spending time in their homes and their neighborhoods, they say, how come we didn't get any of this? Um, and, um, and you mentioned one development in downtown, and I'm not going to go back and look at why deals were done. I'm very appreciative of the investment that they've made. But you got another deal on Dale Mabry that's more than a billion dollars. They didn't get any subsidies. And it's not, in, I don't think it's in a CRA. It's an area that, um, that it needs development too. And there, there are lots of opportunities like that. I think we need to, if we look at, look at the numbers, and now I think everybody in the region is coming to the same agreement. If you look at numbers for economic development, um, Tampa failed compared to other cities in our region, compared to other cities in our state, and compared to our benchmark cities. It's up to us during this time when the economy is going sideways to try to rethink everything. I think we have to question everything that we've done before and look at the most innovative ideas we can to how, how to jumpstart the economy and move the economy forward. If all this investment and all these incentives and all these impact fee waivers, everything in the last 10 years still caused us to come in almost last in the state of Florida and, and, and really low compared to other cities nationally, why should we do keep doing all the same things again? Shouldn't we try to spread the money to other places and and um, and create a, a better quality of life? But more importantly, this money still can be used in downtown. We can still allocate in downtown. If something comes up that downtown needs, we can still allocate. I definitely think that we should keep a strong and vibrant downtown. And uh, you know, my my business partner was one of the founders. I think is not the first or second uh, chair of the downtown partnership. And my firm has been you know big sponsors and supporters of of those organizations and we want them to thrive. Uh, but we also can't do it at, do so much that we ignore the rest of the city. And um, uh, there are so many needs that, that I think we need to address. So uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'll, I'll stop there, but um, I can make that motion now or I can make it at the end. This is a hot topic. You go ahead and make your motion now, sir. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see how this goes. Um, I would like to make a motion to ask the city administration to come back uh, to the CRA board to present their ideas for how to use the money that would go into the general fund if we put a cap on the downtown CRA. And, and I didn't look Vera at the will. Oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you finish your motion, sir? Yes. Uh, and, and Vera, yes. if I may, Mr. Chair, will second. Yes. For purposes, again, of moving this forward and acquiring the information that I believe uh, city council needs to make in order to make a truly informed decision on this prospectively very uh, uh, positive idea. So the motion for Mr. Carson. I have a second by Mr. Vieira. Any more discussion? Question on the motion. Mr. Dinkfield, you're recognized. So the motion, the motion as I understand it, is to say, okay, city, we right now this board has responsibility for, for, for all this money. So if we, want to, if we want to talk about giving you, the city and the mayor, the responsibility for three, four million of it. And how do you feel about that? Isn't that sort of a rhetorical question? Of course, of course, the administration and Bob McDonough and, and Bob Buckhorn and, and whoever, whatever, whatever mayor is going to be there at the time, of course, they're going to want to support that it, just, it, it takes as as mr chairman indicated we we have that authority right now and we're get, and we would be giving it up so why even ask that question i don't get it okay thank you mr chairman do you want me to respond or it's your motion sir um just just brainstorming um you know technically by charter we also control the budget of the city if we exercise that power, um, we can, I think Morris will tell us there's a limit of number of years, but we can designate where we want that money to go um, it, it's sitting as the city council. Uh, but I think Ms. Miranda's idea was a good one that that we, before we make the motion to move it over um, or to, to continue the process, that we would have a more formal conversation 
and we would we would see we would try to see if there's some uh, common ground on how it would be designated. Morris, what's the what's the limit on how far out um, a a city council can designate a budget into the future? Typically, budgets are approved annually, so really the, the commitment and it, it is a year-to-year -year sort of thing. And as you know, there are budget amendments made throughout the year, so you can ask, you know, obviously, the administration how they think they might want to program or use that money in future years. And you're looking a few years out, but um, I'm not sure you can legally, you cannot legally bind the administration saying they're going to present a budget that says that. Now, obviously, when you review the budget, you do you do have you are the ones that approve the budget and so if you're not happy with how certain items are spent you obviously can and have and have made uh, motions to, to request that money uh, be readjusted and and that's part of the budget discussion so um i that that's you, how it would if, work yeah if you all if you all pass this um i'm happy to talk to them and you all you know can talk to them without any of us in the room but um um, I mean, one just brainstorming one way it could work is that we all agree that it would go into a special line item um, with the intent of using it a certain way, and then and then the actual use of it would depend on whether we get five votes, right? And or any future council gets five votes. But there's the opportunity that we can use it in parts of the city that that really need money, or if there's some need in downtown, we can redirect it back. But I think that that not doing this um, puts puts these two that we're only talking about one right now but potentially puts these two puts the whole system at risk because of two uh, CRAs um, that uh, that the legislature would would look at as as being a luxury and and that it's not fair that the rest of the taxpayers of the city subsidize them when when um, basic needs are not being met in other parts of the city but the motion right now is just to bring it back for a discussion again. Mr. Carson, I, I, uh, I can respect your, your, the work you're putting into this, uh, and I understand where you're going with it. I truly do. Uh, and I'll, I'll support whatever the motion is today, as long as it's coming back bringing information. But when I hear some of the things you said and some things Mr. Massey has said, I still say that you're giving up power that you already have now, and you know how the budget goes, different administrations, different council members, you know how this budget could flip flop and how votes are counted. And I'm just very, very afraid that when you're giving up, especially money, you're giving up that power, you're gonna lose out in the end. And that's the only thing I'm afraid of, but I'm willing to hear how this could work. I'm willing to hear how it can be implemented, but I'm just really afraid once you give somebody else a pot of money, they're going to want to hold on to that money and try to allocate how they see fit. That's just my own personal opinion. Uh, yes, we have power at, at, at annually when the budget comes, but at times you know, we have to deal with that those issues and have a little total award time. And sometimes there's good mediation that comes out of it. I, I've been lucky at some good mediation to come out of the budget, but for a line item uh, to be implemented, I, 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 I'm just I'm just very 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 nervous about that right now. But I'm willing to hear what the administration has to say. So if you want to go ahead, just restate your motion, sir. I know Mr. Vieira put a second on the floor. If you restate the motion, uh, I'll be happy to go ahead and put it on the floor again, sir. Sure, I would like. Thank you, sir. I would like to make a motion to ask the city administration to come back to the CRA board to present their ideas for how to use the money that would go into the general fund if we put a cap on the downtown CRA. A motion, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Beard, do you stand with your second? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Yeah, and, and again, I, I second this. I, I, I think there's a good shot that this has, um, or strike that, I think that this has a good shot at being successful. We we all need to hear more information on many of the specifics, including how this money is going to be spent. I want to be clear, though, that in supporting this, I don't support the hypothetical view that the uh, that existence of CRAs, I'm not saying this is being put forward, but I just want to be very clear. I support CRAs. Uh, I don't believe that the major contributing cause of, uh, of um, neglect in certain part of the cities uh, is necessarily CRAs. Uh, I, I want to be very clear about that, but I do think that, again, this is an incremental step um, that can certainly have a net positive effect prospectively, but we need more information. So therefore, I, I'm glad to second Councilman Carlson's motion. 
A motion for Mr. Carlson, second by Mr. Vera. Any further discussion? Any uh, further Mr. discussion? Chairman, may I speak again? You're recognized, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For clarity, folks, I, and I understand that the CRA is over a cap. The money must be spent or should be spent in that geographical area which the CRAs were founded on. However, what we are missing here is to explain from the time that those CRAs started, downtown, Channel 1, whatever, Ybor City, West Tampa, whatever, what growth have we had that may not have occurred? Now, what the CRAs have done, in my, in my estimation, is brought future growth from 20 years down the line to a more manageable, quickly infusing the development at that period of time because it created a pot of money to help it sustain itself and, and make the arrangements and payments that otherwise would maybe not be affordable. But what I'm saying is I like to see when we talk about money, what the CRAs benefited from, but it also what they created a pot of money for the general fund. Because there have been no big buildings and have been no development, where will we be at today? And that's what I'm saying, Mr. Chairman. Just a broad information talk so we can understand. I'm not going to make a motion on it, but I can tell you that the amount of buildings that have gone because of the CRAs it's in the multi, multi, multi millions of dollars. That's all I'm saying, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anybody else for discussion before I put it for a vote? Anyone else? Madam Clerk, call the roll. Dink Felder? No. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Citro? Miranda? No. Citro is here. No. And Carlson? Yes. Motion carry with Dinkfelder, Citro, and Miranda voting no. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We move to require approvals. Item six. Michelle Van Loan, under item approvals, number six is our annual services agreement between the CRA board and agency and the city of Tampa. The services agreement is in the same format that you adopted and approved in February of 2020 that was a restated and amended services agreement. And our updates are strictly the dollar amounts that would be paid to back to the city for the staffing. Uh, the only reminder I would say when you see that number, it has increased over last year for the staffing costs because as we talked about in the spring, with the changes to the organization of our department, our department is now funding a much higher percentage of the CRA staff uh, salaries so that our priorities and our focus as staff is on the CRAs themselves and not also on some of the other city issues that we used to be involved with. We also had an increase in the clean team and city youth in East Tampa of $80,000. So that accounts for some of that increase that we're seeing between FY20 and FY21. A motion on the floor, a motion is, uh, on the floor versus item. So move, Mr. Chairman. So move, Mr. Chairman. Motion for Mr. Uh, Moran, the second by Ms. Maniscalco. Any discussion? Any discussion? Yes, I, Mr. Chair. Ms. Carlson, you recognize. I would just like to thank again the administration and particularly um, uh, Chief Bennett for helping us to bring this in for landing earlier this year. Uh, so this year. I have no comment sorry, or editing. No comment just want to thank everybody. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Madam Clerk, call the roll. Jane Felder? Yes. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Petro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Item number seven. Item number seven is the CRA FY21 Community Redevelopment Agency budget book. Uh, this is the fully updated book. Uh, we gave you the draft last month. 
This one now has all the updated bullets and text and pictures that we put together for you in the book, but you've had the budget now for a month. Uh, so I can happy to answer any questions on the budget book before moving forward. Any questions by any, any member? Any questions by any member? I'll entail a motion at this time for item number seven. So I'm going to I, I did have a question that came out as I was trying to reach for my computer. Um, I think so, you recognize. I have a question. This is basic, basic CRA 101, and I don't, I don't know the answer to it. Um, but I noticed, I think toward the end, one of the last pages, it, it showed that the different CRAs have different millage rates. It's the very last page, page 66. And and uh, I wasn't familiar with that, and I, I didn't know the history on that or why that why that is the case. Is it is it the millage rate that, that's in place at the time that the uh, that the CRA is created, or what is that about? I, I get it from budget office, Mr. Dingfelder, Morris Massey, um, CRA attorney. Yes, it's the millage rate. The, the way the increment is determined is that um, you look at the taxes and the millage rate that was in effect at the time the CRA was established, and then you look at the, the current millage rate and the taxes that are uh, derived from that area now, and that's the increment which then goes into the, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, tax increment fund. So I believe that's the reason why there's a difference there. I mean, I was aware of how we calculate the TIF is the difference between the baseline and where we are today in terms of total amount collected. But what I, what I didn't understand is, is like the downtown is 0 0.006 millage rate, and then Ybor City is 0 0.01 millage rate, which is, it's about, Ybor City is like twice as big as, as downtown. I can't imagine I can't imagine the millage rate changed that much uh, between the creation of downtown and the creation of Ebor, and then uh, and then Channel District is Central Park is slightly different and West Park is slightly different. A, that's a good question. I was I just was looking at the table, uh, Mr. Dingfelder, um, and we'll talk to Revenue and Finance because they provided those figures I think to Ms. Van Loan. I think maybe the, the reason why there's a difference between the various areas is that there's a combined um, uh, rate. Maybe the, you have, as for instance, in downtown, you have a number of special assessments. You have the downtown special assessment. Uh, you have the uh, streetcar special assessment. The same is true of Ebor and in, in the Channel District. You do not have in East Tampa and West Tampa. And so these, that that rate may may be reflective of that amount. So we will ask that question. So that's a good question. Probably just email us, email all of us with a with an answer on that. It doesn't it absolutely, doesn't, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Also, no county millage right. right. And no county, no, and no county rate. I, it, it, downtown. We'll we'll get you an answer on that. So. Okay. Yeah, that's probably is the answer, but it just uh, kind of jumped out at me. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any other questions. The budget looks good to me. A motion for blue by Mr. Moran, and a second by Mr. Maniscalco. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, take the roll. Ming Felder? Yes. Boots? Yes. Manis Kako? Yes. Pierre? Yes. Petro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Ben Carlson? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Item number eight. Item, good morning. Uh, item number eight for downtown is a reprogramming of $865,000. Is there someone that can mute just so uh, we can get the I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, for downtown, the $865,000 is for the Tampa Convention Center. Before we get into the big contract that is being let after the first of the year, we had some smaller uh, improvements that we were doing, three and a half million was budgeted for it. We're about to get into contract. And this is the balance of the money needed, just a little over four million for all of those changes. 
And so this 865,000 is coming out of the uh, fund balance of neighborhood infrastructure to go into the Tampa Convention Center Improvement Projects. Entertain a motion for item number eight. So I'll move it. So I'll move, man. <laughs> A motion for Mr. by Mr. Miranda, second by Mr. Maniscalco. Any discussion? Any discussion? Madam Clerk, take the roll. Dean Felder? Yes. Boots? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Petro? Yes. Medina? Yes. And Carlson? Motion carry unanimously. Item number nine. Item number nine is a reprogramming in the channel district of $170,000. It is for the consultant for updating both the channel district strategic action plan and the community redevelopment plan as discussed and recommended by the CRA board earlier this summer. Motion on the floor for item number nine. So move. So move. Yeah, motion uh, moved by Mr. Uh, Miranda, second by Mr. Maniscalco. Any discussion? <laughs> Any discussion? Madam Clerk, take the roll, please. Dink Felder? Yes. Boots? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Motion carry unanimously. Item number 10. Item number 10 is regarding the East Tampa CRA Down Payment Assistance Program. This is a program that you have already approved that allows $15,000 per applicant to assist with reducing the cost of the home through down payment. The East Tampa CAC vote to increase that amount from 15,000 to 50,000, that's five zero. And the reason for increasing it is to try to counteract gentrification and the increasing housing costs within East Tampa CRA so that the existing residents and renters will be able to afford actual home ownership. Question, question, on, item 10? question on the uh, item. Your record, your record after being filled. Thank you. Um, a, I don't, I don't necessarily see a recommendation from staff and Michelle and Ed. Um, I, I see the CAC is requesting this. But I don't necessarily see the staff recommendation. B, my concern here is, we, we, no matter what, we can't, can't print, print money. So at the end of the day, we only have a limited pot of money to help a lot, a lot of people. So if we give Less people, if you give $50,000 and we raise it from 15, we're going to be helping fewer people um, with more money. So uh, it, if, if staff feels that 15000 isn't enough, then maybe, like Vieira said earlier on another subject, maybe we can take baby steps and maybe consider you know, 25000 or something like that, as opposed to tripling. You know, more than tripling the amount from 15,000 to 50,000. I'm just throwing those thoughts out. But I'd like to hear from staff as well. On this item, On this item the CAC was looking at 50,000. Right now, based on the numbers that we're seeing of the number of applicants, uh, the line item budget can handle that. If we move forward and it became untenable, we could always step that back. It is always at the discretion of the CRA board to motion for the amount that makes most sense for all of you. 25 certainly, you know, within 25 to 30 is a good first step. If we find that housing prices are increasing faster than we anticipated, and also revisit this again. Uh, Miranda, may I speak? We recognize, sir. Just a quick Thank follow you, I, I agree. I agree with my, Mr. Felder said. And furthermore, we don't, what I like to see though, and I understand why, the prices of everything has gone sky high. Even, even though you're giving the lot and they're building on it, 
the, the only house that I've seen is from 180,000 up, including the lot that was the free, which is worth 50 to 100,000. So what's happening here in my, in my estimation is that there are some good people who want to live in a house that don't have the 15,000 or the 20,000 because the prices of the house are so high now that the variable money that they can't make the payment. So I, I would imagine that there's some good people that we're leaving out that need an opportunity to have what's considered affordable housing or workhouse housing, whatever you want to call it, because I don't think we have a, a, an idea of what they got to go through. So I'm not opposed to the, the statement by Mr. Dick Felder to start at 25, and let's calculate though, and maybe from we're asking the good people who are looking for housing. We can find out what percent fall into this category, so we can maybe address them at a later date and make sure that everybody has a shot of having a house. Ms. Van Long, can you address Ms. Miranda's question or his statement? If he supports the suggestion of 25,000, We're breaking up real big time. Thanks, Sam. Mr. Uh, Chair, sure. can I make a comment? Can I make a comment? Yes, sir. The community advisory committee we had, we had been around this around matter, matter at, at its meeting. At its meeting. And one thing that uh, came out of that meeting was after further explanation by our housing and community development department, it was recommended that we use a sliding scale up to a maximum of $50,000, depending on the individual's need, because there are, there are situations where a lender might not necessarily want to lower their dollar amount and the down payment assistance would be obviously lower than lower than the 50 percent maximum so uh, the advisory committee agreed to move forward or request to move forward on a sliding scale up to fifty thousand dollars and that might help uh, might, might help our, our our board members here to uh to understand the difference but quick i don't think that that verbiage i don't think that verbiage is is listed in the uh, proposal, uh, I, I didn't see that verbiage. That thing was out. With, this is oversight on my part. Is that is that verbiage in in the uh, agreement that you're asking? No, that is that, it is not in the agreement because this discussion just happened on Tuesday. Quick, quick comment on so that. There would have to there would have to be an, an amendment made to the to the request. Quick comment, Ms. Bell. Mr. Chairman. Hello. We hear you, but I don't know if we've lost several people. Okay. Who's our vice chair? I, I guess I'm here, Carlson. sir. I can step in. I'm, I'm okay, here. Go. All right, Mr. Can Goods. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Can I, can okay, I good. Can yes, I sir, you respond. You recognize. You recognize. All right, we all had technical glitches for a second. Um, I am reading the memo from Ed Johnson. And on the second line, it says increase from 15,000 to up to 50,000 50, on a sliding scale, depending on need. That, that, that was a, a subtle nuance that I, I, I missed, and I apologize to Mr. Johnson. But here's my concern, my other concern, in addition to not having enough money to spread it around to as many people as possible. But my other concern is, you know, home ownership is not for everybody all the time. Um, and my, you know, let's say a house costs $200,000. Um, that's probably fairly typical for half of the houses that are being built now in East Tampa. If, if the bank is requiring $50,000 down payment, that, that means they're requiring 25% down. So that, that tells me that somebody just has a horrible track record or, or credit history or whatever. And maybe at that point in time, they're really not ready for home ownership. And I, I'm sorry to be mean or mean spirited or whatever, but there's a lot of people out there who are ready for home ownership, who who probably only need five percent or ten percent down, but not twenty five percent down. 
So anyway, I, I'm a little confused on this. Uh, before we move forward with it, I think we could use a little more staff, a little more staff input, um, you know, in terms of how these numbers shake out. So, Mr. Dingford, I'd like to respond to that, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, sometime in the banking industry, uh, sometimes uh, there is some systematic institutional issues when you're dealing with uh, certain races. Uh, that happens often, very often. And also, you know, you look at certain communities, some people may have had some credit history in the past and may have cleaned the credit history by going to credit counseling and so forth. But again, they're still discriminated because of their past. Uh, so I, I understand what you're saying. I respect what you're saying, but sometimes there are some systematic issues that preclude people from being able to advance in life or getting what they really want in life. So uh, I just want to put that out there to you, sir. But I do understand what you're saying. That's why I asked in reference to Mr. Johnson's. I must have missed that memo about the sliding scale. But I think if that verbiage is is in the uh, the the proposal, I mean, I could support that because I do understand that. Everyone has a different need and everybody has a different pocket value. So uh, I, I could support it, but I need to make sure that that language could be in that, implemented into the, uh, the verbiage. Anybody else for discussion? I appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I don't mean to be sound cold, callous or indifferent. I do know that we do have systemic problems in, in all of our systems, um, but um, um, like I say, some, sometimes, sometimes or just not ready, not ready. But two or three years later, two years later, credit or what have you, they might have you, they might do it. That's just my two cents. I, and I, again, I, I, I would agree with you. I, I, I've talked about that before that everyone is not ready for home ownership. I totally agree. That's why I do believe that when you're talking about some of the homes that you have, for, it can be rehab, uh, maybe some apartment down uh, uh, assistance to get in some of these apartments and things like that because everyone is not ready for home ownership. And we may have to look at that as well, but I think you have to have a broad scale when you look at trying to help people, as it, again, it relates to rehab, as it relates to apartment uh, rental to help them get in, and also home ownership. So I, I do respect what you're saying, sir. Anybody else for discussion? Anybody else for discussion? I'm going to ask that uh, I'll pass the government make a motion to uh, for uh, I'd like the staff to come back. So, Mr. Good Carlson, if you could, uh, uh, yes, sir, I can pass the gavel to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you'd like to make a motion? I can make yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion that staff take this item back to the CEC uh, with a full for discussion as it deals with the dollar amount on the sliding scale as it relates to rental assistance for apartments. Rehab and home ownership. We have a motion from Mr. Goods. Any second? I'll second it, man. I'll second it. Second from Maniscalco. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Dean Felder. Uh, since if it's going to include that language of up to fifty thousand on a sliding scale, I'll support it. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Cedro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Yes. Motion carry now. Chair, you want the gavel back or you want the gavel back? Yes, sir. All right. We'll go to uh, information reports and new business. We'll start with uh, I'm sorry. We'll go back. And miss, we'll go with uh, Miss Van Long. She had a uh, uh, a motion she wanted to put on the floor. Miss Van Long, you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and tell us your motion so I can get someone to to make it move. Thank you, sir. Michelle Van Loan. I'm requesting, if it's a pleasure, the CRA board to approve our uh, ability and request to move forward with creating a position for a communications and project coordinator to be situated within the CRA department. Thank you. So I'm moved. on the floor by Ms. Villon. I can move and, and I'd, I'd uh, include in that motion uh, that Ms. Van Loan will, well, let me put it this way, that we delegate to Mr. Carlson, the vice chair, um, 
authority to work very, very closely with Ms. Van Loan um, on advertising and selection for that position. I have a motion for all by Mr. Dean Felder. I have a second. Second, Carlson. Second, Mr. Carlson. Any discussion? Any discussion? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Dean Felder? Yes. Goose? Yes. Honey Skako? Yes. Sierra? Yes. Citra? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move to information Thank you. for us in new business. Uh, Mr. Dingso, do you have anything today, sir? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Vera, do you have anything today, sir? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Good meeting. Nothing at all, sir. Mr. Mariscal, do you have anything today, sir? No, sir. Great meeting. Thank you for your leadership. Mr. Carlson, anything else today, sir? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, the motion, Ms. Van Loan, the motion that we talked about earlier about the 30% for affordable housing. Um, I, t let me let me throw this out and tell me if this is a, 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 what we should say. I would like to make a motion to ask the CACs and staff to allocate 30% or more of CRE district funds uh, to affordable and workforce housing and to report back to the CRA board quarterly on the progress of this goal. Yes, sir. We can come back and report quarterly with that goal and where we are and also the progress on the programs that are instituted within that 30%. Mr. Ratchey, does that motion sound okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mo motion on the floor, Mr. Carlson. Second by Mr. Dingfelder. In well, discussion. I have a question on the motion. Okay, Mr. Dingfelder, you recognize. Okay. Mr. Carlson, is that, and maybe Mr. Massey needs to chime in, is that a hard and fast thing or is that just an aspirational goal? That's why I wanted, I had the same question to, to Mr. Massey. I, and by the way, you probably heard I added in the reporting part that you had requested, but um, um, Mr. Massey, is this the way I should word it? I said, uh, to I, ask I think it needs, to, it needs to be expressed as a, aspirational at this point in time. Uh, uh, we can't effectuate that immediately, but obviously we, you can express that, that that is the aspiration that you want staff and the CACs to work for it. I think that would be the better way to, to, to phrase that at this point. And we can come back with quarterly reports on the progress we're making. Uh, give me one second. Okay, how about this? I would like to make a motion to ask the CACs and staff to work toward the CRA board's aspiration to allocate 30% or more of CRA district funds for affordable and workforce housing and to report back to the CRA board quarterly on the progress of this goal. Second. Motion by Mr. Carlson, second by Mr. Dingfeld. Any discussion? Discussion. Any discussion? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Dingfelder. Yes, yes. Goods? Yes. Aniscaco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Citro? Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Yes. Motion Citro carry. Votes yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you, everyone. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Cicero, anything today, sir? I'm sorry, nothing today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Miranda, anything today, sir? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carlson, I pass the gavel to you one more time, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I received several texts during the meeting. I had several of the East Tampa neighborhood presidents call me. They were delighted that we took up a lot of the issues that have been discussed in the community as it relates to the East Tampa Partnership, as it relates to the CEC board, as it relates to uh, tree trimming, as it relates to a lot of the issues that we talked about. Uh, again, uh, the big issue is the, is the inclusion. And I believe that the ETCRP, the East Tampa Partnership Board, had, hit, had its time, but that time has dwindled. Uh, and uh, like Ms. Ben Long said, it's 
it's a confusion in the community. And we need to clear that confusion up. I think it's still a place for it, but I believe that how the West Tampa CRA is functioning, making sure that all the community presidents are part of that board, uh, of the main board, and that way everyone is informed of what's going on. They can bring information back to those communities. Uh, and now you have a cohesive uh, group of people working together versus all this division we have. Uh, what I do like to make a motion that the uh, Ms. Van Long and her staff uh, come back with a couple of ideal plans that can fuse the uh, current CAC and East Tampa partnership together uh, that will make it a cohesive program to move East Tampa smoothly. I'll, I'll second. I'll second your motion. I've always been confused by it, uh, going <laughs> all the way back 16 years ago when I first served on the CRA. I, I never understood who, what that other board was, and, and why it existed, and anything else. So it seems duplicative. And, all, and also, I thought that in Ebor City, it seems like we've got some sort of duplicative situation there too. But, but anyway, we'll just we'll just take one one at a time. But I'll second your motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. Oh, I'm I'm serving as chair. Sorry, I can't. Get, anybody? Any other discussion? Um, could I just weigh in? Um, I I would um, maybe ask that you request in there uh, some kind of public discussion or public meeting um, so that we can hear feedback from the public because there are people with strong views on both sides of this issue, and we need to make sure that uh, that those voices are heard. Well, I, th I think that's a part of the motion that Ms. Van Long will get with the those 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 uh, the community leaders and so forth to come back with a couple of ideas or plans or some existing plans that some other CREs are using, and that way we can make an informed decision. All right. Any other discussion? All right, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, roll call, please. Dean Felder. Dean Felder. Yes. Boots. Yes. Maniscaco? Uh, yes. Vieira? Yes. Etra? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carl? Yes. Motion carry now. Anything else, Mr. Chair, or you want me to hand it back? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Can we close out? Any other council members have anything else? Anything else? Motion, Mr. Second. Mr. Miranda. I'm sorry. Second by Mr. Maniscalco. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Dean Felder? Yes. Boots? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Vieira? Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Carlson? Motion carried with Vieira being absent at vote. Gentlemen, again, it has been a pleasure serving with you today. Meeting adjourned. Good meeting. Good meeting.